And we're live. Welcome in. Happy Neuralink show and tell day. It's Wednesday, November 30th. I'm so bad with dates. 7 o'clock on the dot p.m. Central. 7.30. Can't even say the time right. Make sure you can hear me okay. Make sure you can see me okay. This is one of the very, uh, not very well-known things that are, is happening in uh, the world of tech. There's literally things in your brains now. They put chips in your brains and it does stuff, I think. <laughs> Do you have your chip in your brain today? Let me know in the comments. I have mine. I'm talking to you right now through my chip. It's not me talking. I am literally talking to you from my chip to your chip. Where are you from? Make sure you can hear me okay. Make sure you can see me okay. It's going to be a super chill stream. We're going to sit down. We're going to watch the stream together. Um, we're going to talk about some things beforehand. We're going to talk about things afterwards as well. It's going to be a live coverage of the event. Um, and yeah, so if anybody has any thoughts, anything they want to talk about before the stream, uh, we'll have producer wife in the background. Producer wife is a new addition to the uh, Farzad Masbahi team by marriage. <laughs> and so she'll be in the background, do all the producing stuff. She'll bring up comments and stuff, but um yeah, make sure you can hear me okay and uh, and and uh, you can see me okay. Let's pull up some uh, some locations here. Who do we have? We got people from we got people from Mars, Pennsylvania. We got people from uh, Nebraska. We got people from Tacoma. Look at this. We got people from the Netherlands. We got people from Montreal. My goodness, Costa Rica. Wow, Maryland, Barcelona. Insane, dude. We got people from everywhere. Barcelona, Indiana, Hong Kong, Atlanta, New Zealand, Poland, more New Zealand, Wayne, Pennsylvania. Wow, this is insane. Australia, Kansas, Philly, Costa Rica, Washington, Nashville, Tennessee, Canada, Sweden, Portugal. Dude, this is how awesome is this? Dallas, New York. This is a worldwide event. It's worldwide. Prestige worldwide. Where's that from? <laughs> India, Israel, Vancouver. I have way too much energy for uh, it being a little bit later in the evening. Uh, my goodness. Out of control. Oklahoma, Bulgaria, Florida, Finland. Look at this. Okay. Are you drinking anything? I am going to have some thirsty goat uh, to enjoy this, this event with y'all. It's like a big party, right? I already poured the first bottle in a glass cheers everybody mm -hmm. delicious but yeah drop your comments drop your thoughts what, what are you guys expecting from this event what what do you think is going to happen um for me it's i'm really curious i i, I have no idea what they're going to show i really don't I, there was a um, article written by an mit person um producer wife if you want to pull that up here in the background as, as we talk about it um there was an article written by an mit uh writer or a writer that writes for the MIT journal I forget exactly what they think it might be related to read and write of data using vision uh in some way to try and sort of show that you can both write data and read data I guess from the chip to and from your brain through your optic nerve or some crazy stuff like that so um once future wife has that pulled up here we'll, we'll show it to you guys but yeah, it's uh do they do human trials? I think they've only started with uh with monkeys right now. From from my understanding, I think they've only done some animals, no human trials yet. It's uh it's going to be really exciting to see. Cuz you think about like, the implications, the long-term implications of this technology for those that are, you know, have some sort of physical um problem or anything like that. The, it's transformative. It really is. And uh, until they get it to that point, obviously, you want to make sure that they're uh, super um, safe, you know? But it's, yeah, it's it's wild. It's completely wild. Um, let me send this link to uh, <laughs> having some uh, technical difficulties in the background here. here. Um, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. Keep expectations low. I tend to do that with these events as well. But what's what's also the optimist in me is like, okay, this is super under the radar. Nobody knows what's going on, right? Like it, very few people pay attention, especially as of late. It's been hardcore Elon Musk, Twitter, freedom of speech, craziness, right? And then something like this, it's going to go completely under the radar unless they really blow your mind, right? 
Here's an article from a thank you, producer wife. Article from a MIT Technology Review. That's what it was. Here's my guest. Neuralink will unveil a vision implant at today's show and tell, written by Antonio uh, Regalado. Sounds Spanish. Zoom in a little bit there, producer wife, so I can see it a little bit better, if you don't mind. Perfect. And then scroll it down a little bit. This was posted today, actually. Uh, let's do a quick uh, read through here and see what they uh, what they're saying. In the next event scheduled for tonight at six o'clock Pacific, um, please join us for a show and tell. Uh, okay, keep going, keep scrolling down. I think there's going to be more juice down there in the, in the bottom. Let's see what, what else they got. Okay, here we go. With that in mind, I predict Neuralink will announce it is not only reading brains with its electronic interface, but is now writing information into them. Something it could demonstrate with a vision prosthetic that generates images inside an animal's brain. That's possible because elect electric Electrically stimulate, stimulating the visual cortex, which lies at the back of the head, produces flashes of lights called phosphenes that an animal or person can perceive. That's freaking insane. I think the demonstration could work like this. Researchers will send stimulation into a monkey's visual cortex, creating spots of light arranged into, say, the shape of a letter A. Imagine, furthermore, that the monkey is trained to tell you what it sees, for instance, by typing the letter A on a keyboard. That could be the show and tell hinted by Neuralink and in its an, an, an announcement. That would be completely nuts. The first demonstration you could make, uh, people see spots of light by stimulating people's brain states way back to the 1970s. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's basically around that idea of being able to use Neuralink to decode what an animal could see. And like that, that opens the door for things like you can kind of start like quote unquote reading your pet's mind how many of you are dog owners and you're looking at your pet and let's say they have a neural link in their head like how much would you actually wonder what is that dog thinking about when it's chasing its tail or it's giving you the puppy eyes or it's running around like crazy in the in the yard what if there was a way for us to like understand exactly what kind of emotions they're feeling through this i mean that's crazy that is obviously outside of the realm of what it's actually trying to do which is solve you know <laughs> freaking broken backs and all this uh, potential, you know, mental illness in some way or any other things that could be solved through a technology like this in the brain. But the long-term implication of this, of this are completely insane. And the fact that we're living in a world right now where we're seeing firsthand what that technology is going to, is going to do for people and, and humanity. And we're seeing the very early stages of it is like completely mind blowing, completely mind blowing. What do you guys think? What, what do you guys think is um, is going to be shown? Let's pull up some comments, uh, uh, producer wife, as you see some that uh, <laughs> I would like, want to bring up hers. I love to talk to my dogs. <laughs> Cindy Moon. Yeah, I know. Me too. Uh, not reading your pet's mind by opening up sen new senses if you were to start relaying other types of information via the same tech. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Um, it's like it's implications of this technology are nuts completely nuts humans will know how animals think <laughs> humans are stupid <laughs> oh man that's funny yeah i don't know i don't know i don't know we're supposed to go live in about 20 minutes with the event as well so i'm, I'm curious i'm curious to see i'm just so excited let me read my twitter feed and play destiny through my neural link that's a like multitasking right you can start multitasking with the technology and and uh so pretty being productive at the same time for sure we probably think much more alike than we think i've wondered this a lot i've actually talked to my wife about this before i think like how many emotions are shared between other humans and you feel like you're experiencing something that's very unique to you like a feeling or emotion but how many other people are experiencing that same exact emotion than you are and you can't explain it, but like you feel it. I wonder how much Neuralink, say 20, 30 years down the road, how much is that technology going to enable us to understand our emotions and understand our, our feelings? And how big of a tool is that going to be to bring us all maybe a little bit closer? Because then we start realizing, wow, I'm living this moment in time. That's, I don't know, super unique to me. And it's bringing up all these emotions and feelings. And then you tap into someone else that, that's having a completely different type of experience that's invoking the same emotions and, and feelings. 
and they're the same as yours, but they're triggered by a different thing that they're that they're living in. That's freaking insane. Like, think about that, right? If we're able to actually share those emotions with each other, would be like, like, and would you want to, right? Would you want to do that? Uh, C6 paralyzed, quadriplegic for 28 years. Super excited for this event. Thank you so much, Chris, for sh for uh, sharing that with us. Um, man, I would love if if you want to share. Like, I mean, would you be would you be somebody who would take part of of say any trials if, if it's something that could help you, uh, you know, regain some function back? How do you think about that, Chris? I would love to hear your take because that is like completely, you know, a life changing event turned into a life changing event. You know, it's like nobody. It's. I'm sure I can't even imagine the difficulties of living through that um, sort of thing happening. But oh man, the 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 wonder of potentially reversing that damage could be. Man, talk about changing a lot of people's lives. It would be nuts. Um, oh, thank you so much for the eight dollar Australian uh, uh, super chat, man. Thank you so much. The security and military aspects. Oh, <laughs> gone. Thank you for your money. Goodbye. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the security and military. I'm not even drunk yet. Just wait. The security and military aspects of humans will, uh, with service dogs could be amazing in time. That's a very uh, good point too. Right? Um, yeah. Because then you can really have a, a much closer relationship with them. That'd be nuts. That'd be completely nuts. What are you guys drinking? Are you drinking anything? I'm having a uh, thirsty goat amber ale. First time I've ever had it. Chris says yes. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Chris. That's a thirsty go right there. Um, I wonder how many more people that are sort of in that situation would be willing to do those trials, right? I feel like that's probably a lot. It's probably a lot. I guess it, 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 how early in the trial would you want to take part? I think it's probably more. I mean, there might be some risk aversion because, you know, I'm sure the it's still a very uh, new technology that's in its infancy. So I'm sure human trials probably won't start until... I think producer wife, see if he can find when Elon Musk thinks produce uh, human trials will begin with Neuralink. I want to say he said sometime next year, but see if he can find that uh, on the Googles. Uh, when when Elon Musk is planning to start human trials for Neuralink. Um, Tessa Boomer Mama, so good to see you. Oh, we got Boomer Mama in the house. There she is. You already received the wine? Not yet. I do have beer though. Boomer Mama, you're the best. Gifting us wine. Ah, oh, what a awesome, awesome person. If you if you've uh if you've missed it, Alexandra, myself, and a new face to the uh, Tesla community, Ron Carter. We had a conversation earlier today about a broad range of topics. A lot of it was obviously Elon Musk focused, and a lot of the risks that he faces from different forces trying to derail him and. It was a little over two hours long, but boy, it was that time flew. And I thought it was a very valuable conversation for the Tesla community because I think oftentimes, I don't know, we like maybe we don't talk about some of these things because not they're not important or we don't want like like people are avoiding them per se, but it's I don't know, it's kind of difficult and weird sometimes. And you have to pair yourself up with people that are willing to kind of <laughs> go through some uncomfortable moments. And not that, that those people don't exist, but I'm just, it's more a, uh, just how thankful I am to have people like Alexandra and people like Ron and obviously anybody else who has, who has come on my channel to talk about these things. It's, I don't know. I think, I feel like that's how you really get to the bottom of things and help others understand what's going on and also help yourself a little bit and having somebody on the other side of you that knows what they're talking about and they can formulate ideas really well. So thank you, Alexandra. And obviously thank you, Ron, for Always having my back, man. It's freaking awesome. So lucky. Luckiest person ever. Great discussion. Just finished it. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, Alexandra and Ron just made it amazing. Made it amazing. They really did. Uh, if uh, T6 para, uh, paraplegic, so I'm very excited as well. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Harsha. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like uh, we've had a couple folks uh, on the stream already that are... Um, paraplegics that are very much looking forward to what Neuralink has to offer. And that's the humanity aspect of this thing, right? Uh, when will Neuralink be available? Uh, Neuralink executives in 2019 said they were aiming for the first human clinical... Look at all those ads. Human clinical study in uh, 2020, 
Okay. In April, Musk said the company was on track to conduct its first trial application of Neuralink in a human by the end of 2022. So this was back in 2019, right? Is that the date of this article, babe? Is that what this is dated at? Or is this just a... Uh, let's see. When it was this dated? This was... Okay, yesterday. All right. So um, one of the potential announcements could be that uh, maybe they figured out some results from their human trials, potentially. Who knows? Yeah. What else do you guys think? Oh, thank you for hosting this. I just I just like to have fun. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Neuralink's happening. I love Neuralink. I know other people love Neuralink. Let's just hang out together. Let's just cheers. Cheers. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Mm. By the way, we surpassed 20,000 followers on Twitter, y'all. Crazy. Thank you. Completely nuts. Just saw a rumor on Twitter. Elon will go on stage with an implant that will be able to make the pig noises from the last event as if he is the pig. <laughs> what will that do to Tesla stock? <laughs> what do you think will happen? Oh, my God. Of course, I'm just getting now getting here and I assume I missed it. But all I know is that hoodie is fire. Thank you so much, Buck. Th Buck is a longtime supporter of the channel. He's on our um, on our private discord. If you want to join our private discord, consider joining our Patreon if uh, or through YouTube as well. I have a merch store as well. So if, if you want to support the channel since Buck threw it out, this you can find on the merch store as well. It's sick. And of course, I say that because it's my freaking merch. <laughs> so if you're interested, check it out. I do really try to make the merch just something you want to wear every single day and as high quality as humanly possible. So, um, Kuba, 20,000 is just the beginning. Congrats, man. Thank you, man. You guys are so nice. Really appreciate you. Really appreciate you. Um, yeah. What, what else do you guys think is going to happen here? We're about 13 minutes away from the, from the event. Look at that producer wife with the, with the beast plug. The Elon community is the best. Thanks for hosting Farza. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. It's uh, not your mom. <laughs> Yo, sometimes people got the best freaking comments for real. The uh, names rather. Seriously. Um, yeah, what do you guys expect to see? What do you guys expect to see? Let me know. Uh, drop your um, your guesses below. Do Let's do a poll. How about this? Let's do a poll. Um... Producer wife, do a poll and ask, do you think do you think there will be a human trial announced at the event? And see what um what the responses are. Is there a, will there be a human trial uh shown at the event? And we'll take it from there. Uh what audio interface are you using with the SM7B? Yeah, sure, no problem. I would love to uh share that real quick. So it's a sure SM7B, and I'm using a Scarlet. Um, 18 i20 audio interface and my DAW, the thing that I use to do all the sound mixing, is using Ableton Live 11. And I have a here's some some nerdy production stuff. So I have a denoiser, an EQ, a compressor, a master, and a limiter on. And so, like, if I turn all of these off, you can see how my voice probably has changed dramatically for y'all. And if I turn on the denoiser, the EQ, the compressor, the mastering, and the limiter, it goes back up to where it was. And that's really getting off subject here. The amount of time I spent researching this stuff is completely insane. I don't recommend anyone spend as much time as I did, but I think it was worth it because, so maybe it is <laughs> worth spending that much time. Audio is so important, right? And I and I and I spent a lot of time ensuring that the production of this stuff is as high as as, as humanly possible, so that y'all can enjoy it, you know. And I'm still working on stuff too, so, um, yeah. Product reveal of the first human implantable minimum viable product. That'd be sick. I really doubt they have regulatory approval for any human trials at this point. That will likely take five plus years. That's one of the um. Uh, sort of concerns other people's had, other people had, and I wonder why Elon felt when well, I guess it's Elon. I was going to ask why did he feel that he would be get he would get it down by twenty end of twenty twenty two. It's because it's Elon. <laughs> yeah. 
Sounds great. I just ordered a setup in the same boat. Uh, researching, diving myself nuts. Uh, Which DAW? Uh, Ableton Live. Ableton Live. What was the one? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Producer Wife needs a mic. Okay. If you would like to see Producer Wife in one of these streams, type it in the comment section below. Let her know. She's a shy. Producer Wife is a very shy woman. She is one of the smartest, the smartest, most intelligent, most capable, wise, just an amazing person. And I think she would be so great to have as a counterpart from time to time talking about this stuff. So if you would like to see producer wife on a stream, just let her know in the comments. Let her know. That's all I'm saying. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> she sent me a private message. <laughs> I'm not going to read what she said. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. That's so funny. Nine minutes away from the event. Thank you all very much for joining us. We're just uh, hanging out together. We're waiting for the uh, event to come live here uh, a few minutes before we go um, live with the stream. We'll pull it up on the screen so we can kind of see it side by side. We'll make sure not to miss anything. We're just kind of talking about what do we think we're going to see at the um, at the event, either from Elon or the team. And we actually have a poll that we've created as well. So if you would like to take part of that poll, it should be in the comment section somewhere below here. And if you're enjoying what you're seeing so far, throw us a like, subscribe if you want to see more content from me. And last but not least, cheers, everybody. It's Wednesday night. Okay, producer wives on fire. Look at this. <laughs> uh, can you pull up, um, yeah, can you pull up the, the Pong video with the monkey? I, I sent it to you on Discord. It should be, um, yeah, it's the monkey with the pong. For those that haven't seen this, this was shown at the last event where there was a, a monkey literally playing pong with uh, a computer or whatever, a gaming system with its mind, with its brain. Completely nuts. Completely nuts. Um... Yeah, let me know if you can, uh, it should be on YouTube. If you type uh, Monkey Pong Neuralink, it should come up. And then once we have that fired up, we'll uh, we'll share it to you. We'll share it with you. Um, Faza can be the host for Producer Wife and Boober Mama. Dude, that would be, who would, who would not want to see that, right? Yeah, but make that a full screen for us. The other, the other full screen. Yeah. Look at that. So for those that don't know what this is, this is a monkey that has a, a neural link implanted in its brain. And every time it, or yeah, the, the monkey lands the dot on the square, the food, the pipe dispenses food. And you can see that it's using its hand to move the joystick, right? But in reality, the joystick is not actually connected to the computer. It's the monkey's signal from the brain that it's sending to the hand for the joystick that's being recorded by Neuralink. And Neuralink is the thing that's moving the freaking dot on the screen. So it's telepathetic, telepathically, telepathetically. I'm not even close to being freaking buzzed. Telepathically, it's moving the dot on the screen, right? So now we're just looking at a tree. Okay, so it's recording the the, the brain waves there. Yeah, the brain waves for those that haven't seen this. And then if you, I think if you scroll a little bit, it, okay, perfect. You see how that joystick is now disconnected, right? So the monkey thinks it's using the joystick to go there, but it's the brain that's talking to the hand that Neuralink is recording is moving the dot. When I saw this for the first time, I'm like, this is the craziest thing of all time. There's a freaking monkey doing this. It's not a human being. It's a monkey. And the monkey is using its brain to move the dot. And I keep repeating myself because this is crazy. <laughs> this is crazy. Telepathetically. Look at this. Who should I make a telepathetically merch item 
let me know. <laughs> uh, this is crazy. Let me know what you guys think of this monkey. What's the monkey's name even? Does the monkey have a name? And if it doesn't have a name, should we give it a name? Man. Look at that. And now it's playing Pong. Not freaking playing Pong with its brain. It's not even using a joystick. It's literally using its brain. It's crazy. I hope I'm not the only one that's like literally completely mind blown by this, by this thing. It's like crazy enough that your brain's doing that, but it's a monkey's brain that's doing that. Uh, uh, animal that doesn't play video games. Okay, like this guy is not on Twitch clapping cheeks on cod you know what i'm saying he's literally eating a banana that's what he does for a living and he's playing pong with his brain or she man brian is his name brian the monkey i'm so sorry i misnamed you <laughs> chimpanzee look at these you, you you guys are so clever with your puns ah uh, all right I got to hurry up and finish this beer here. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Thank you for joining me. Uh, producer wife, let's pull up the uh, event side by side just to get it um, get it uh, synced up. And uh, we should do another poll. Here, let's end the current poll and let's start a new one. And let's call that poll, will the event start on time? Because <laughs> my gut tells me no. These usually run a little behind. Hope you're enjoying the evening. I'm enjoying. I'm having a great time. I'm having a blast just hanging out with y'all and producer wife in the background, which all of you want to see as well, right? So, yeah. Thank you all very much for joining me today. And then uh, I sent you the link on Discord as well for the uh, thing, by the way, for the for the show and tell. Should be the last link I sent you. Okay, last one started on time. All right, so it should be. We should be starting here in three minutes, huh? If that's the case. Let's go ahead and uh, and pull that up then, and uh, start tracking it. Let's get it set up here. New relic. There it is. Perfect. All right. So we got nothing right now. Oh, by the way, um, just uh, you shared the audio, right? On that, I know you got to hit like a check mark to make sure the audio is shared. If you did that, great. If not, that's okay too. We can just always restart it. Uh, great interview live stream today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alexandra and Ron are great. Great, great, great uh, guests for sure. Uh, could you put your camera on top of the full screen instead of side to side? Uh, your camera on top of the full screen instead of side. So you mean like when we go to this. Um, so what is it, like this view? Like on the top, I think I can. I think this is the only other alternative, I believe. Uh, I don't. Th I think that's the only one, and then we can do that one as well. Probably either this one or the. We we'll probably, we'll probably do this one because it's the biggest. I guess we'll figure it out. You know what? I let the producer wife figure that out. That's why I hired. I hired her. <laughs> you know, she's killing it too. Uh, bottom better. Okay, so we'll do the bottom one. Okay, no problem. I was absolutely blown away by AI Day and uh, and hope for the same. Yeah, AI Day was insane. I think that the one thing that's being uh, a little bit missed is... Not missed, but... Elon gets so much attention for his... Stuff on Tesla, SpaceX, hardware stuff, right? But the software stuff is completely... Still not well understood. And that's because, you know, full self-driving is not everywhere yet. It will be. But once that starts getting in people's hands and they start... I, I went for a full self-driving drive today. Uh, we went to Chick-fil-A to pick up some food. And full self-driving is so freaking good now. It's insane. It, it's still not absolutely perfect, but it behaves so much better than it did not even three months ago. So once more people start getting that in their hands, I think more of this abstract stuff is going to be more um i think more solidified for folks to understand and things like Neuralink and like the bot and full self-driving are really gonna 
drive a lot of uh, folks to be quite, you know, surprised. Quite surprised. How's the event? Uh, let's pull up the event and see if it started yet. Has the event started yet? It's uh, 8 o'clock. And not yet. Okay. Does it say waiting for uh, waiting for Neuralink? Okay, so we're not live yet. So what's how's the poll doing? Let's see. 70% said no so far. <laughs> you have one minute. You have one minute to see if you get it right. And are they going to be late? Yeah, it's private. The event the event is private, but uh, there's still a live stream for it. And we're just waiting for the live stream to go live. Uh, it's slated to start at 8 o'clock. Let's see. It's 8, 8 o'clock in the... In the um, Let's let's uh, let's throw this view up from time to time just so f folks can see we uh, we have it queued. We're just waiting for the for our friends at Neuralink. Eight oh one, look at that. End the poll. They're late. That's it. Bunch of people just. We should have uh, 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 did some sort of uh, like a raffle or something. If you get it right, you get a high five. Congrats, everybody. <laughs> Who picked no? All right, we're just waiting. We're waiting for the event to come up. We're very excited to see what kind of magic the team at Tesla is going to show. Cheers, everybody. We just cracked a thousand viewers. Thank you so much for joining me today. You could have just went to the Neuralink live stream. And the fact that you decided to come to my live stream means so much to me. Thank you so much. Producer wife, hit the like button if you're enjoying the stream. My God, we're so professional here. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Oh man, let me know what you guys are. are um, what are you guys drinking? You guys drinking anything? Water, kombucha, Buck. Thank you, dude. Oh, Buck, you don't have to do this, bro. You're like freaking incredible. I heard they are going to implant a Neuralink chip into Mary Barra tonight, and she will magically admit she has no idea. <laughs> oh man, if you uh, follow the Tesla story. You probably know what Buck is talking about here. If you don't, and you're just here for Neuralink, welcome. You probably won't get this joke. And if you do, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Thank you, Buck. Oh, man. What's the best Neuralink pun you can come up with while we wait? There was one, uh, the chim the chimp Pong Z was pretty good. As we were watching the, uh, the monkey play Pong, that was pretty sick. Chimpong Z was, was pretty sick for sure. I'm drinking Everclear through a straw. Hmm. That's dangerous. <laughs> Not advisable. But free country. You know? <laughs> Do whatever. I guess free country, right? Depends where you're from. Where are you from? My God, we have almost 1,200 people. Where are you from? Drop it in the comments. We did an initial poll at the beginning when we had only a couple hundred people. Now we have over a thousand people. Where are you from? Let us know. When is it live? Uh, I was supposed to be live three minutes ago. We're just waiting for Neuralink to go live. Look at that. We asked for some Neuralink puns. I saw one that was pretty good. Ready? Neuralate. Look at this. India, Israel, Austin, Texas, Germany, Switzerland, Australia. California, Boston, Milwaukee, Minnesota, Austin, Texas, Mexico, Toronto, India. How about that World Cup, by the way? Montreal, Africa, Wisconsin, the Netherlands, Turkey, New Zealand, Australia, Antarctica, California. Man. Canada, California, Jersey, Scotland, Uruguay, Berkeley, Los Angeles, Sweden, Mars. Wow. I didn't know we got uh, this channel. I got to check my uh, channel stats here. Friggin'. We have not just international, but like interstellar. Good movie. Eh, good movie. Yeah, it wasn't bad. Iowa, Indonesia, Cleveland, Hawaii, Chile, Maryland, Massachusetts, Austin, America. Look at this, man. This is so cool. I'm so humbled. Thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, man, you're the best. You guys are the best. Seriously. Vegas, Poland. Look at this. Thursday afternoon. Awesome. So many people. So many people. Thank you so much for the $2 super chat. Appreciate you. 
Damoral Wink. Is that a pun? <laughs> oh man. Michigan, Ohio. Oh boy. I don't should I should I should I talk about it? Those that follow college football know what I'm talking about. Should I talk about it? Should I talk about it? Maybe I shouldn't. I went to Penn State, so I have they literally both teams beat us. So Spain, España, ¿cómo estás, tío? I was born in Spain for those that don't know. Uh Lebanon. Uh oh my god, my states. Oh no. Is that even a state? Is NO a state? Am I losing my mind? Or is that just no? <laughs> like, is there a state with uh, cause there uh, MO is Missouri, N E is Nebraska, but is there an NO? Oh god. Oh, it was a response. Okay. I'm like, what state is no? And how, why why am I why can't I figure it out? Denmark, New Orleans. It's not New Orleans, it's New Orleans. Right? Look, two people from New Orleans. I love it. Oh, the, the no wasn't a response to the football. Got it. Okay. New oh yeah, Nola, right? New Orleans, Louisiana. It's my terrible, terrible southern accent. Dominican, awesome. New Oklahoma. This is a a new state that's going to be developed here uh, once uh, the Oklahomans have their way. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Let's pour the second beer, guys. 1,500 viewers. Thank you so much for joining me. We're waiting for Neuralink to go live with their event. And uh, oh, look, did they move it? I think they moved it. Did they move it? No, it's still 8 o'clock. So we're waiting for Neuralink. So for those, we started a poll not too long ago where we asked if uh, they're going to start on time. 70, what was it? 72% of you said no. Congratulations, you all win nothing. Well done. Cheers. <laughs> what are you doing there, producer wife? <laughs> she's just she's just moving stuff around now. <laughs> Man, I'm excited. Does it feel like we're just hanging out in a room together, just waiting for this event? I hope that that's the vibe I'm trying to go for. You know, one of my buddies, I think he's hosting a, a watch party. And he said he was going to throw up my stream. So if if you have my stream up, I hope it's entertaining at the very least as we wait for our friends at Neuralink to, uh, to go live. Hola. How are you? We got people from Peru as well. 9 o'clock Eastern. Yes, it was supposed to go uh, live about seven minutes ago. It's uh, Hopefully it goes live soon. But listen, what was the most... I'm trying to remember what was the event where they were the latest. I think the Model X unveil event, they were like two hours late. Or was it the Model X delivery event? One of those events that were at least an hour late. They could have been even two hours late. It was wild. I'm not saying that this one's going to be two hours late. And if they are two hours late, damn it, I'm going to keep drinking beer and provide entertainment for y'all and probably get myself banned <laughs> in the process. <laughs> So, cheers. Here we go. Oh, don't worry. I won't get drunk. I just get a little tipsy. Thank you all so much for joining me. Seriously. 1,600 viewers. This is very humbling. This is something that I did just for fun. We usually cover a lot of Tesla and Elon Musk and stuff. And I live stream quite often. And one of the things I always try to do is connect with my community and my channel. Honestly, like I, I pride myself in what you see here is what you're going to see in real life. And I try to really try my best to make sure I just break something, make sure that that's a big part of my channel is that we're just kind of hanging out every time I make a video or a live stream, we're just hanging out and I'm just throwing my ideas out for y'all and try to give you guys a platform to throw it back to me too, either on the comments or wherever else. So. Seriously, thank you all so much for for um, supporting me through this last year. Like, I can't tell you how much it means to me. Seriously, it's like I might start crying, but I'm not. So, and I'm trying. So, thank you. Seriously, it's very humbling. Thank you all very much. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. 
<laughs> hey, everyone, donate so a producer wife gets paid. Fars makes her do this for free. I do make her do this for free. It's true. She is my wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's the best. I'm the luckiest man on earth. 810. 10 minutes uh, to go from, or 10 minutes since it was supposed to start. And we're still waiting. Is he late? Yep. Unfortunate. But that's kind of what happens. Thank you, Judy, for the $5 super chat. Super appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Listen. If we weren't on stream. Uh, what if Elon w uh, would announce that he already have Neuralink implanted for a few months now and he is tweeting it with it daily? You know, honestly, sometimes he tweets so much that I wouldn't be surprised. But I think uh, it's probably extremely unlikely. Think about the, you know, the repercussions of it going bad. You have the wealthiest person in the world, excuse me, who's in charge of one of the largest companies in the world in Tesla is doing experimental things with his brain, which is it's his, his most powerful asset. Ugh. Ugh. That'd be sick, you know, but boy, it's uh, it's it's a little scary. But thank you so much anyway for the super chat. It would be scary. I would I would be like shocked if that was the case, you know. Maybe is that what's making them try to pick a war with Apple and stuff, you think, with T Tim Apple? They actually made up a little bit. I don't know if you guys saw him um uh the 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 tweet lately. They were um very amicable. It seems like Elon visited the headquarters and of Apple, and it seemed like they uh, came to some sort of agreement as far as Twitter and the app, app store. So it's awesome. It's awesome. 1,000 likes to get producer wife on screen. I mean, Tim, it's not my idea, but if you all get it to 1,000 likes, I'm not going to stop you. And of course, producer wife, of course she would abide by this, right? Of course she would abide by this. Why wouldn't she abide by this? Thank you, Tim. Listen, I'm done. I'm done doing the peer pressuring. It's y'all's turn, okay? <laughs> I've done enough. Your turn. <laughs> Lies. I didn't write that. Who's hacked into my account? Damn it. Ron Carter was very good, but he demonstrated that he is out of touch when he expressed concerns with Elon's family situation. Um, yeah, I don't know if, it's, if he was so much out of touch. I just think, um, I think it, he brought up something that, you know, very few people would would say, honestly. But it's, I think it's, I could see how some people would be, quote unquote, turned off by that. And of course, it's his private life. And I think Alexandra, the way she verbalized sort of it, her disagreement with that is, is legitimate, but I wouldn't say necessarily is out of touch. I think it's just more, it's more grounded around, you know, what, what maybe certain people's moral compass is and how they would perceive it as negative, but I'm more in Alexander's camp. And I think Ron is as well. Um, it was just something that was brought up. It, there's a certain segment of the population is probably very small that would view that as a negative. And that's why I think it was discussed. And that's one thing I really try to do with my channels, like any idea that folks uh, bring up, we want to discuss it. And just like, you know, Rick, obviously you've made a comment on it, which I really appreciate. I want everybody to feel comfortable voicing their opinions on this stuff, because ultimately I think that's how we get stuff done the best. And I don't think we do that enough as a population. So, so I appreciate you uh, bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah. This stream is lit. Buck, you're lit. And if I keep, and if I keep drinking these, I'll be lit. <laughs> uh, far as you're tipsy yeah am I tipsy we should make a poll just kidding <laughs> uh, I thought this started at 9 uh, 9 eastern it's supposed to be 8 pacific uh, we're still waiting for Neuralink it looks like we're 15 minutes past start time and Still no stream, but that's okay. We'll wait. We're just hanging out. 2,000 viewers. We just broke 2,000. Thank you. Thank you. You could have gone to their stream. 
you came to mind instead. Thank you so much. Mwah. Seriously, thank you. Really appreciate it. <laughs> for what? <laughs> Tell us for what? Uh, what am I drinking? I am drinking uh, Thirsty Goat Amber Ale. First time I ever had it. It's pretty good. I'm usually an IPA guy. Uh, it's pretty good. What is it? 6.8% alcohol. It's not bad. 30 IBUs. Not a sponsor. I'm having too much fun. Somebody, somebody stop me. Uh, when is this starting? It was supposed to start at 8. Uh, these usually go late or they start late so who knows we should do a new poll yeah yeah how late will they be okay i'm gonna make this poll right now i think producer wife is uh walking the dogs how late will this event start question mark we're gonna do so we're already 50 minutes late so we're gonna go 30 minutes <laughs> 45 minutes one hour more than that <laughs> all right polls up let us know we are waiting for newer link we are waiting for newer link i've been talking to myself for 45 minutes y'all i just realized that i guess that's what these live streams are huh? i am tipsy damn it <laughs> How did I meet my producer? Thank you so much for the super chat, man. Uh, I let... Um, oh, man. Should I blow up her spot? I'm not going to blow up her spot. No, no, no. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, super chat, man. Farz out your channel has been one of my best finds this year. Thank you for all, all your hard work. Thank you so much, man. That means a lot. Thank you, Rob. That's super sweet. Thank you. Uh, Spain demands producer wife greeting. <laughs> Dude, we'll get her on. She's she's so she is so shy. I'm telling you, if y'all <laughs> arrange marriage, <laughs> no, it was not an arranged marriage. Uh, no, it was not. If uh, you want to see producer wife on one of these streams, just let her know in the comments, man. I've tried. You know how the hard I've tried. Do you know how hard I've tried? This is the smartest person I've ever met, and she just happened to marry me. And I've tried so hard, producer wife. Come on the stream with me. It would be amazing to talk about these things with somebody who doesn't follow the Elon Musk story and I get to bounce ideas off of you. And we could sit down together and talk about this stuff, right? She's like, well, you know, no. But maybe if she hears it from y'all, well, she just might change her mind. Uh, is Apple going to ban Twitter? No, actually they made up. They made up, so... Um, it seems like uh, they're going to be in, in good shape. There was a, a, a stream from, uh, what was it? A tweet not too long ago. It was about an hour ago. Team uh, uh, Elon posted a video of him being at the Apple campus. And then he replied to that tweet. Actually, I'll bring it up. Why am I talking as if like, I can remember this properly? My goodness. I have the power of the internet at my fingers. And I choose to make it difficult on myself. Ay, ay, ay. Come on now. Let me pull this up. Producer wife, I'm going to take the wheel from you for like a hot second and I'll give it back, I promise. So this is uh, Elon Musk. Thanks, Tim Cook, for taking me around Apple's beautiful headquarters. And then good conversation. Among other things, we resolved the misunderstanding about Twitter potentially being removed from the App Store. Tim was clear that Apple never considered doing so. So for those that were afraid of a huge spat between um, Apple and Elon, you should feel much more at ease today, for sure. For sure. Thankfully, right? Nobody wants that. I appreciate your Farza. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate you. Thank you, brother. Uh, do you speak Farsi? Thank you, Richard. Uh Oh man, my Farsi is so broken. Salam, hello, shomacha tore, which means hello. How are you doing? How how are you feeling? Nusha Jun, dasted dar nakone, dasted dasted dar nakone, dar nakone. Dude, my Farsi is horrendous. I can understand it perfectly. I can barely speak it. Yeah, I can barely speak it. 
I love producer wife. I produce for my husband too. Anna, tell my wife to come on stream one of these days so that people can appreciate her hard work, man. She showed. Let me know if you you uh, you go on your uh, on your husband's streams or you're just kind of hanging out in the background. You know, she does such such good work. I want to be like, yo, check it out. See, look, even please see that producer wife. We got to get her out of her uh, shyness. She hates me right now, by the way. She freaking hates me right now. <laughs> I'm already for his workshops. Nice. Awesome. Uh, fascinating that Elon has such harsh doubters that love to prognosticate his failures when he proved them wrong with Tesla, SpaceX, Starlink. Won't, won't he ever get the benefit of the doubt? There are some people that will definitely... Um, <laughs> my wife keeps sending me private messages. Uh, there's definitely people that doubt him like very unfairly, right? They're like, oh, Tesla's a scam. Oh, Elon, you are a freaking fraud scam artist and then literally they walk outside and half the cars on the road are teslas what the fuck right so that kind of person is detached from reality unfortunately I'm not saying they're bad people they just don't know what they're talking about and uh yeah there are certain things that elon does though that benefit from some constructive criticism and i i think we do a decent job on this channel to do that oh my god are we starting? Okay, so something's something's happening. Uh, I heard SBF explain through tonight a Neuralink implant caused the whole FTX scandal and asked Elon, please turn me off, help me. <laughs> Thank you so much for the super chat. Honestly, I'm shocked, shocked that he even had an interview after all the stuff that he's allegedly done, right? Shocking stuff. Like I can't, I can't believe rant time. I cannot believe that the guy is getting the coverage he's getting right now from mainstream media. It blows my mind. Blows my mind. So the lesson I learned is give a bunch of politicians a bunch of money and you won't be in trouble. Got it. Learn my lesson. Crazy. All right. Uh, producer wife, let's make sure we have music on uh, for the audio so let's go ahead yeah do you hear any music yeah let's just put that on the background a a are we gonna get demonetized mute that <laughs> screw it i don't care about the money um yeah let's let's put this music instead of the other one and then maybe turn it down a little bit so it's not like uh, so we know exactly when they're going live yeah sweet all right, so something's something's happening. Something's happening. Oh yeah. Uh. -huh. All right, I'm excited. Oh, dude, we got Jordan in the house. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Look, producer wife is telling you right now. Hit the like button if you are enjoying the stream. Thank you very much. Man, where are they going to show? Where are they going to show? Uh, what kind of commentary are you planning to add during the event? So I'm going to add zero commentary during the event. I'm going to let them speak. And then at the end, I'll sort of share my thoughts and recap. And then we'll just hang out together and talk about what just happened. You know, just imagine we're all just hanging out in the same room, watching this together. That's the kind of vibe I'm trying to uh, ca capture here. What's going on with Boring Company seems to have died. Thank you so much, Jim, for your uh, super chat. It's very much alive. It's just very slow going from the looks of it. Um, they're still working on, on many different things, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't say it. Tim said it. Look, producer wife, producer wife's getting all kinds of shout outs, man. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, please react moderately during an event. Okay, so I'll I won't mute my mic. You guys, let me know about this. I won't mute mute my mic, my mic, and I'll make sure you know producer wife keep me on the screen so you can see sort of my reactions. 
And if there's something I'm like, whoa, this is crazy, I'll say something. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll stay quiet. If you guys are okay with that, let me know in the comments. Producer Hype. Should we rename Producer Wife to Producer Hype? That might work, right? <laughs> Some of these comments. Do you make Producer Wife cover her face and skin? Why would you ask that question? Let me know. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Neuralink just tweeted starting soon. Perfect. So that'll be like 45 minutes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> soon enough. Soon enough. Producer wife is better. Okay, we'll keep producer wife. We'll keep producer wife. Producer wife's not real. Some people might think she's a figment of my imagination because she's never appeared on this thing, right? So this whole thing, I could just be making her up. I'd be like, yo, producer wife. This whole time just like single and just hanging out, right? I'm not married. Funny thing is, if you are on my Twitter, you probably know who producer wife is. But I won't point you to follow me on Twitter up there somewhere. No, I'm not going to do that. Don't follow me on Twitter. Thank you so much for your super chat glasses stapler. We have no idea how the brain actually works, only using heat signatures to guess, but let's put wires in it and turn on the electricity. Seems like a good way to find out. Uh-oh. What's the stream doing? Okay, it's back. Hey. Very, uh, oh, here we go. All right, crank up the volume. They're getting overwhelmed. Oh. So this is a weight screen for the weight screen. Okay. Hopefully, uh, we hear something here soon. Here we go. Nope. Nope. Not yet. I don't think it's well turn on turn on the volume a little bit. I don't think we're ready. <laughs> I think this is like their this is our hold. We don't want to show you just the one screen, we want to show you a different screen. Did I miss anything? No. Yeah. We're still waiting, y'all. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, let me know where you're from. Drop it in the comments below as we wait for our newer link to come on live. Only 30 minutes late. Waiting for them to go live here. Oh my God. Chris, that's too kind. Wow. $50 super chat. Thank you so much, Chris. I liked your producer wife's ride along uh, with FSD recently. She should join you once in a while, but I think she needs to keep you reined in from behind the screen. <laughs> she does a very good job with that. Chris, thank you so much. That's a very generous super chat. Thank you so much. Seriously. Thank you. Man. Cheers, everybody. As we wait for Neuralink to come on. Hopefully they come on soon. The people from Denver, Yorkshire. Fantastic. Toronto. Not Toronto. Can you hear my dogs? Toronto. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Will I get in line to get a neural link? Probably not. Probably not. Not anytime soon. I'm going to wait for them to like iron out the kinks and then uh, I'll think about it. <laughs> the never ending uh, red state of Florida. Nice. Montreal, Florida. What is it like in there, by the way? I can't. I just 
still to this day, I, can't, I cannot believe. <sighs> New Zealand, Victoria, Montreal, North Carolina, Brookshire. Anyone from Taiwan? Let us know. What are you playing for semi event? Can you turn out the music a little bit, uh, producer wife? Thank you. Just a little bit. Not too much. Yeah, perfect. Um, uh oh. They're getting overrun. They're getting overrun. I'm just going to do uh, some coverage of the event pre and for about like an hour or so. We'll talk about what to expect. I, I ran some models about the semi and other videos I want to cover. And then after the event, we'll also do uh, like a recap. And we'll talk about it as well. So it'll be similar to this one. Similar to this one. Thank you all so much for your support, by the way. If you're enjoying the stream, throw me a like. Helps with the channel a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, quadriplegic. Chris, thank you so much for the super chat. Quadriplegic, waiting for the event. Keep up the great work and produce a wife. Thank you, Chris. Honestly, this personally, I am so excited for this for folks that have suffered some physical damage that, um, you know, to their body that's, right now irreversible if this technology can help those folks boy have we done something incredible for humanity so thank you chris man for joining us today um you're a fucking beast man you're a beast thank you so much thank you so much western oregon i don't think i've ever had anybody from oregon on the stream thank you so much for joining me your guitar play awesome thank you my guitar definitely plays awesome. It's not me. It's my guitar. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> it's not me. It's a freaking guitar. Uh, we are producer wife. Elizabeth Grace. Producer wife. You have people that connect with you. When will you come on the stream one of these days? Share, share your wisdom with all of us, producer wife. You know, I, I wouldn't have been here without you, producer wife. Join us. Come on. I have chronic disabilities that affect my ability and vision. I'm partially um, sighted from it. So hope the Neuralink works. I hope so too, man. Oh, damn it. Every time the song changes, I think they're going to go live. This is a great question. Why is producer wife? Not who or what, why? This is a very philosophical question, y'all. We should all ask ourselves why sometimes, right? Why is Farzad Misbahi? Why is producer wife? Only producer wife could answer this question. So she needs to come on one of the streams one day. That should be the first question. Why are you producer wife? What is producer wife? These are the right questions. Come on now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's that's a neural link, bro. The neural link is not installed right. You might want to <laughs> poke it around. <laughs> like your neural link's broken. <laughs> that joke is not funny, but I I'm laughing. <laughs> This is not good. Uh, this beer is kicking in. We're in trouble. This is this is a problem, y'all. This is not good. Oh yeah, yeah. Not good. Elon is now following following Tim Cook, and now Tim Cook, Tim, Tim Cook, is not. The bromance has begun, y'all. Tesla's gonna make a phone, and Apple's gonna make a car. That's what's going to happen here. They're just going to they're going to switch roles, put iOS in the Tesla, and then freaking the phone can be Twitter OS. That's it. We're done. It's all come full circle now. Amazing. How much have you had to drink? Not enough. Honestly, here's my problem. I've been uh, losing weight quite a bit these last few months. 
And uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. I've noticed. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't, I don't really drink often, to be honest. I'm not a big drinker. But I love beer. And sometimes when I'm just hanging out, you know, um, producer wife, hit the live, hit the live button on the newer link on the, on the video, just to make sure we're fully caught up. You might be a little behind because of the, of the lag. Um, but yeah, I'm not a huge drinker. And anytime I, I do drink, it hits quick. You know, I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm a lightweight. Buck, if stream gets to 2,500 Farza t-shirt giveaway, of course. Of course, Buck. Great idea. Great idea. We have a merch store. Of course I'm going to plug this. Man, Buck. Making my, like, media relations PR person. Oh. Damn it. If we get the stream to 2,500, we'll do a shirt giveaway. Ready? We got some shirts right here. Boom. And it's in the description below. I'll bring it up in a second. What am I doing? I just broke it. I'm sorry, guys. How dare I plug my merch and destroy the stream at the same time? But we'll do that for sure. Yeah, so let's see if we can get 2,500 people. Thank you, Buck. Hey. Thank you, DRK. Appreciate you. I've uh, I've invested a lot of time making sure it's the right stuff. Damn it, I thought we were going live. Son of a bitch. Producer wife should at least be mic'd up in order to comment during Farzal's podcast. I think that would be a very good first step, right? Like, get the feet wet. Just ease into it, you know? You don't have to just... We don't have to throw her in the pool right away. Let's give her some floaties, you know? Wear, like, some... Those arm ones, like, the arm things. And even just, like, the hoopy thing around your waist. We'll just mic her up. We'll put, like, an avatar on her picture. Maybe, like, a picture of, I don't know... Somebody. And that could be her... <laughs> she just... <laughs> I don't think she likes that idea. Uh, Darby, thank you so much. $5 super chat. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, my God. You need a shirt with the monkey uh, playing Pong. Dude, Neuralink should come out with that. I would hate doing that. Because um, I don't want to, like, steal their IP, you know, even though they probably won't care, but I doesn't feel it's right. But maybe maybe they, sh they should totally do that, right? Paul Kim, thank you so much. $2 super chat. Yo, Far, say what's up, Paul Kim? What's up, Paul Kim? What's up, Paul Kim? He literally paid me to say that. Are we live? Okay. Crank it up. Crank it up. Where's Tim Cook? All right. Welcome to the Neuralink show and tell. So we've got uh, an amazing amount of new uh, developments to share with you that I think are incredibly exciting, as well as tell you about the future of what we're planning to do here. It's uh, now this is meant to be a technical podcast, or sort of like a we're, 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 I'm going I'm to provide an overall summary, um, and then we're going to have a number of members of the, the Neuralink team come in and give a, a deep technical overview of the various areas. So uh, yeah, so let me move forward with the, the overall summary. Now, some of the things I'm going to say are things you've, well, if you've been following Neuralink, you've already heard before, but uh, for, for a lot of people out there, they've no idea what Neuralink does. And so I will be a little bit rep repetitive of things you may already know, but 
that others do not. So, um, the the overall the overarching goal of Neuralink is to create a uh, ultimately a whole brain interface. So, uh, a, a, a generalized input output device that, in, in you know, in the long term, literally could interface with uh, every aspect of your brain, and in the short term, uh, can ask can interface with uh, any given section of, of your brain and and uh, solve a, tr a tremendous number of things that that uh, cause de debilitating issues for people. So, uh, you know. So our, our long term is I'd like. I'll, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about our long term goal. Uh, it's going to sound a little esoteric, but it's the. It, it was actually the sort of my my prime motivation, which was, you know, kind of what 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 do we do about AI? Like, what do we do about artificial general intelligence? Uh, if if we have digital super intelligence, that's you know, just much smarter than any human. How do we mitigate that risk um, at, a, at a species level? How do we mitigate that risk? Um, and then even in a benign scenario where the AI is uh, very, very benevolent, um, then how do we even go along for the, go along for the ride? How do we, we participate? Um, and the... I mean, the conclusion, I, the, the, the thing that, the, the biggest limitation in going along for the ride and in aligning uh, AI, I think, is the, is the, the bandwidth, the, the, how quickly you can interact with the computer. So we are, we are uh, all already cyborgs in a way in that the, your, your phone and your computer are extensions of yourself. And if you, I'm sure you found, like, if you uh, leave your phone behind, uh, you you might end up tapping your pockets and and it's like having missing limb syndrome. Like where you know the the phone is it is leaving your phone behind is kind of like a missing limb at this point. You're so used to interfacing with it, you're so used to being a de facto cyborg. Um, but but so, so what's the limitation on on a on a phone or a, a laptop? The limitation is the the rate at which you can receive and send information, especially the, 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 the speed with which you can send information. So if you're interacting with a phone, it's limited by the speed at which you can move your thumbs uh, or the speed at which you can talk into your phone. This is an extremely low data rate. Um, you know, maybe it's like 10, optimistically 100 bits per second, but a computer can, can communicate at uh, you know, gigabits, ter terabits per second. So. This is the fundamental limitation that I think we need to address to mitigate the long-term risk of artificial intelligence um, and also just go along for the ride. And uh, yeah. So, but like I said, that's, that's, that, that's an esoteric explanation that I think uh, will appeal to a niche audience, um, uh, some of whom may be here, um, uh, but, uh, and and that's a that's a very difficult problem. So even if we do not succeed with that problem, I think we, we, we like we are confident at this point that we will succeed at many. Uh, it's it's solving many brain injury uh, issues, spine injury issues along the way. So um, yeah. So anyways. <laughs> So uh, actually, we have uh, Justin Roland. Roland in the audience. Uh, this is a, hi, Justin. So it's a little Rick and Morty reference here. Um, the uh, was great Rick and Morty episode about intelligence enhancement of your dog, and uh, what's the worst that could happen? So uh, anyway, I, Rick and Morty, I recommend it. <laughs> um, so for. for so you want to be able to read the signals from the brain. You want to be able to to write the signals. Uh, uh, you want to be able to ultimately do that for the entire brain, um, and then also extend that to uh, communicating to the rest of your nervous system if there's a if you have a, a, a sort of a severed spinal cord or neck. 
So uh, now this is a this this video is now 18 months old. So this is um, Pager, uh, who is playing uh, Monkey Mind Pong. So this is a P Pager has a neural link implant in this video, um, and the, the thing that's interesting is that you you can't you can't even see the the neural implant. Um, so it's the it's we've miniaturized the neural implant to the po point where it, it matches the the thickness of the skull that is removed. So it's essentially the it's sort of like having an Apple Watch or a Fitbit uh, re replacing a piece of skull with like a you know a smartwatch, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better uh, analogy. Um, so. Uh, so you can see, you really can't, it, it, he looks pretty, he's normal. Um, and I, I think that's pretty important. If you have a Neuralink device, like I could have a Neuralink device uh, implanted right now, and you wouldn't, <laughs> you, you wouldn't even know. I mean, <laughs> hypothetically, <laughs> I, maybe one of these demos, in fact, one of these demos I will. Yeah. Tesla stock <laughs> stockholders. So, uh, and yeah, fear anyway, right so, so here's here's a. I mean, first of all, like, it's kind of wild. Hey, monkeys can play pong. They're like uh, they can actually play pong if you give them a joystick. Uh, so Pedro first learned to play pong with, with a joystick. So I'm like, that was novel. And it's like I didn't know monkeys could play pong, but they can. Um, and then uh, so we first trained Pedro to play pong with a joystick. Then we took. The joystick away and have the, the neural link and now this is he's playing telepath it's a te tele telepathic video games essentially telepathetic um so what we've been doing since then is uh, we've been on the the very difficult journey from prototype to product uh and i've often said that prototypes are easy Production is hard. Um, it's really, I'd say, a hundred to a thousand times harder to go from to go from a prototype to a device that is uh, safe, reliable, works under a wide range of circumstances, is affordable, um, and done at scale. It's it's insanely difficult. Um, I mean, there's an old saying that you know, that it's one percent inspiration, ninety nine percent perspiration. But I think it might be ninety nine percent, ninety nine point nine percent perspiration. Um, you know, the best example I could give of an idea being easy, but the execution being hard, is going to the moon. It's uh, the idea of going to the moon, easy. Going to the moon, very hard. <laughs> so, um, and uh, we've been working hard to uh, be ready for our first human. And obviously, we want to be extremely careful uh, and certain that, that it will work well before putting a device in a human. But we're, we've submitted, I think, most of our paperwork to the FDA. And we're, we're, we think probably in about six months, we should be able to have our first wow. link in a human. So. That's a huge deal, y'all. It's a huge deal. But as I said, we, we, we do everything we possibly can to test the devices before, uh, not, even, not, not even going into a human, before even going into uh, an animal. So we do bench top testing, we do accelerated, accelerated life testing. Uh, we have uh, a fake brain simulator uh, that has the, the texture and uh, it's like emulating a brain, but it's sort of rubber. and. Uh, so any we, we, before we would even think of putting a device in an animal, we we do everything we possibly can with rigorous bench top bench top testing. So we're not cavalier in putting devices into animals. Uh, we, we're extremely careful, and uh, we we always want the device whenever we do the implant, uh, if it's in a she sheep or a pig or a monkey, to be confirmatory, um, not exploratory, so that. We, like we, we've, we've, we've done everything we possibly can with bench top testing, and, and only then would we consider putting a device in, in an animal.
Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll actually show you a, a, a demo later today of, of in a few hours really of, uh, a, a, of implanting in a brain proxy. Um, and if anyone in the audience wants to volunteer, uh, <laughs> we have the robot right there. So let's see, and since, since the pager demo, uh, we've expanded to work with a troop of six monkeys. Uh, we've, uh, we've actually upgraded pager. Um, they do varied tasks, um, and we do everything possible to ensure that, that things are stable and re replicable and that, things la that the device lasts for a long time uh, without degradation. So, and uh, what you're seeing there is it looks like the matrix, but that, that's uh, actually, th th that's a real output of, of neural signals. So that, that's, that's not a simulation or a, just a screensaver or something, that those are actual neurons firing. That is one of the, what one of the readouts looks like. And um, here you can see uh, Sake, that's one of our other monkeys, uh, typing on a keyboard. Right. But, uh, now he's, it, this is telepathic typing. So to be clear, this is the, the he's, he's not actually using a keyboard. He's moving a, a, the cursor with his mind uh, to the highlighted key. Now, now technically, um, uh, we can't can't actually spell, and uh, <laughs> so I don't want to oversell this thing, uh, because that's uh, that's the next version. Um, so the, but what's really cool here is is um, Sake the monkey is moving the mouse cursor using just his mind, moving the cursor around to the highlighted key. And then spelling out what we, uh, you know, what we want, what we want to spell. But um, and then, uh, so so this this is uh, something that could be used for, for somebody who's who's say uh, uh, quadriplegic or tetraplegic uh, human. Um, even before we make the the, the spinal cord stuff work, uh, is being able to con uh, control a mouse cursor, control a phone. Um, and we, we're, we're confident that you, that uh, someone who is has basically no other interface to the outside world would be able to uh, control their phone better than someone who has working hands. So, yeah. and I mentioned upgradeability. Upgradeability is very important because uh, our first production device will be much like an iPhone 1. And um, I'm pretty sure you would not want an iPhone 1 stuck in your head if the iPhone 14 is available. Um, so it's going to be, it's um, be able to demonstrate full reversibility and upgradeability. So you can re remove a device and replace it with the latest version, or if, if it stopped working for any reason, um, re replace it. It's, it, that's, that, that's a fundamental uh, requirement for the device at your length. And I should say both Saki and Pedro were upgraded to our late, uh, latest and greatest implants. Uh, so uh, that, that's been really over a year and a half now that, that Pedro has had for the, for the first implant and then the upgraded implant. So this is a very good sign that it lasts for a long time with no uh, observed ill effect. I think it's also important to show that um, Sake actually likes doing the demo um, and is not like strapped to the chair or anything. So uh, it, it's, yeah, so um, the monkeys actually enjoy doing the demos because they, and, and they get the banana smoothie and it's kind of a fun game. So um, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is like we care a great deal about animal wel <laughs> welfare. <laughs> and. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure, we, like our monkeys are pretty happy, you know. So as you can see, a quick decision maker on the fruit front. So, so for our, the first two applications we're gonna aim for in humans um, are restoring uh, vision. And uh, well, the, the, I think this is like notable in that even if someone has never had vision ever, like they were born blind, we believe they can. They, they can. We can still restore vision. 
Um, so, uh, because the, the visual part of the the visual part of the cortex is still still there. Um, so, uh, yeah, even, even if they've never seen before, uh, we're, we're confident that they, they could they could see. Um, and then the uh, the other application being in the motor cortex, uh, where we would initially enable someone who uh, has no ability, to, almost no ability to operate their their muscles, you know, sort of like a sort of Stephen Hawking type situation, and um, enable them to operate their phone faster than someone who has hand, working hands. Um, but then even, obviously even better than that would be to bridge the connection. Um, so uh, take, take the, out, the signals from the motor cortex and um, let's say somebody's got a broken neck, uh, then uh, bridging those signals to neural link devices located in the spinal cord. So I think we're, we're confident there are, no, there are no physical limitations to enabling full body functionality. Uh, so, uh, I mean, as miraculous as it may sound, uh, we're confident that it is possible to restore full body functionality to someone who has a severed spinal cord. Wow. So, yeah. So, yeah. All right. Um, and then I, I want to emphasize again that the primary purpose of this update is recruiting. Um, a lot of times people think that they, you know, they, they couldn't really work at Neuralink because they don't know anything about biology or how brains work. Um, and the thing that we really want to emphasize here is that you, you don't need to, uh, because when you break down the, the skills that are needed to uh, make Neuralink work, it's actually many of the same skills that are required uh, to make a smartwatch or uh, modern phone work. So it's sort of, you know, software, uh, batteries, radios, inductive charging. Um, and, uh, you know, as well as things that are specific to, to us, like animal care and clinical and regulatory matters. Um, obviously, machine learning, <laughs> that phrase is used a lot. Um, but we obviously need to interpret the signals from the brain, um, which is a biological neural net. And the best thing to interpret a biological neural, ne neural net is a digital neural net. Um, so this is, if there's one message I want to convey, it is that if you have expertise in creating advanced uh, devices like watches and phones, computers, uh, then your, your capabilities uh, would be of great use in solving uh, these important problems. Um, that's, that's, that's more than anything the message I want to convey. Uh, so um, let's see. Uh, yeah. So with that, I guess, DJ. Uh, so. <laughs> so, so DJ's uh, uh, was on the, the founding team of Neuralink and has made immense contributions to the company, uh, as of many of the others who will present. Uh, but I want just to thank DJ for his immense contribution to uh, Neuralink and. Frank. All right, DJ. All right. Go, cool. Thank uh, cool, DJ. Thanks, Elon. When I moved from South Korea at age 13 and needed to learn a new language to communicate, I wondered whether there are better and more effective means of communicating my thoughts to the outside world. And Watching Neo learn Kung Fu and the Matrix, I remember thinking, wow, I want to work on that, uh, work on making that possible. And today, 
I believe that this is a tractable engineering challenge. Since everything about your intentions, your thoughts, and your experiences are all in your brain, encoded as firing statistics of action potentials, if you're able to put electrodes in the right places with the right sensing and stimulation capabilities, this and many other applications that Elon talked about are possible and we can help a lot of people. I'm incredibly excited to be working on this ambitious yet important mission to make that future a reality here at Neuralink. And I'm also incredibly honored to be working with some of the brilliant colleagues, uh, scientists and engineers across many engineering disciplines uh, to work on this intersection of biology and technology. You'll hear from several of them today to learn about the breadth of technical challenges we, cha challenges we face and our progress in the last year. And I think you'll find that for most of these challenges, as Elon mentioned, you don't need a prior understanding of how the brain works. And that a lot of what we do is applying engineering first principles to biology. Uh oh. So <laughs> how do you create a high bandwidth generalized interface to the brain? From day one, we focus on a set of foundational technologies that are safe, scalable, and capable of accessing all areas of the brain. These three axes, safety, scalability, and access to brain regions, really form the basis for how we engineer products here at Neuralink. Safety, because we want to make our devices, as well as the installation, as safe as possible so that we can drive the adoption of this technology. And scalability, because as we make our devices safer and more useful, more people will want it. And with scale, we also want to make it more affordable. And access to brain regions so that we can expand the functionalities of our technologies. So our first steps along these dimensions for our device is what we call the N1 implant. It's a size of, of about a quarter, and it has over 1,000 channels that are capable of recording and stimulating. It's uh, microfabricated on a flexible thin film arrays that we call threads. It's fully implantable and wireless, so no wires, and after the surgery, uh, the, the implant is under the skin and it is invisible. It also has a battery that you can charge wirelessly and you can use it at home. So similarly, for implanting our device safely into the brain, we built a surgical robot that we call the R1 robot. It's capable of maneuvering these tiny threads that are only on the order of a few red blood cells wide and inserting them reliably into a moving brain while avoiding vasculature. It's, it's quite good at doing this um, reliably. And in fact, because we've never shown an end-to-end -end insertion of a robot in action, uh, we're going to do a live demo of the robot doing surgery in our brain proxy. Nice. So who wants to see some insertions? I do, DJ. So here it is. That's our R1 robot with our patient alpha who is lying comfortably on the patient bed. Uh, this is what we call the targeting view. So what you're seeing is this is a picture of our uh, brain proxy. And the pink represents the cortical surface that we want to insert our electrodes into. And the black represents the vasculatures that we want to avoid. And what you're seeing is these hash marks with numbers that represents where we intend to put each of our threads. So should we see some insertions? So this is another view real quick. Uh, on the left is the uh, view of the insertion area. And on the right, uh, what the robot's going to do is it's going to peel the array, uh, the threads, one by one from its silicon backing and insert it into the target's 
that we uh, predetermined in the targeting view. So, there you go. That's the first insertion. So we're going to see a couple more insertions. The whole process of inserting uh, about 64 threads in our first product is going to be around 15 minutes uh, for this robot. So um, yeah, there's a second one that went in, and we're going to do a third one. There you go. And then that's going to go in the background, and we'll come back to it in the later part of the presentation. Thanks. And as Elon mentioned, we've been working very hard to go from prototype to building product. As part of this, one of the things that we did is to move our device manufacturing to a dedicated facility in Austin for scale-up manufacturing. And what's important to highlight and is evident in this clip is that it's very typical for us to have our engineers who design also work on the physical manufacturing line to build and debug. And this has been extremely, extremely critical in reducing our iteration cycle time. And we've also uh, scaled up our surgery. So we now have a dedicated, our own OR, in fact, a double OR uh, in Austin. And this is just a stepping stone before we, um, eventually build our own Neuralink clinic. Wow. So with this product, N1 and R1, our initial goal is to help people with paralysis from complete spinal cord injury regain their digital freedom by enabling them to use their devices as good as, if not better, than they could before the injury. And as Elon mentioned, over the last year, this has been the central focus of the company. And we've been working very closely with the FDA to get approval and to launch our first in human clinical trial in the US, hopefully in the six, uh, in next six months. DJ. So hopefully this gives you a good overview of our product. For the next hour, we're going to go through a deep technical dives on these topics to tell you about our technical challenges, share some of our progress, and preview what's coming next. So with that, over to Nir from my team, who's going to talk to you about neural decoding. Thank you, DJ. Good job, DJ. Hey, everyone. My name is Nir Evan Fenn, and I'm the head of Brain Interfaces Applications. Our goal is to enable someone with paralysis control a computer, as well as me, or even better. We'd like to provide fast and accurate control with all the functionality of computers that works anytime, anywhere. So I'm very excited to show you how we're using the N1 device with our software and algorithms to achieve this. Last year, we shared with you a video of Pedro the Monkey controlling computer cursor with his brain. So how do we do that? Just a brief reminder. First, we record this neural activity from the motor cortex using the N1 device. We, have, we can record from over thousands of channels while he's playing with the joystick. Then we can train a neural net that predicts the cursor velocity from the patterns of his neural activity. With this decoder, we can then control a cursor just by thinking about it without even moving the joystick. He can play with this decoder a variety of games, also a grid task where he's moving the white dot towards the yellow target. Every time he gets one, he receives a drop of his favorite smoothie. And he chooses to play this game every day. Here you can see his performance from early 2021, around the time we released the previous demo. It's quite accurate, but it's a bit slower than what we would like. And Kersen Control is the foundation for interacting with most computer applications. So since then, we've been working to improve Kersen's speed and accuracy. As you can see, it's much, much faster. Almost twice as fast. Yeah. However, it, it's still, still a bit slower than what I can do. So we are working on creative ways to improve that. 
Now, speed is not enough. You want a full set of functionalities. And for decades, most software was built for mouse and keyboard control. And it doesn't make sense to reinvent this entire ecosystem for brain control, at least for now. So we are working and we are designing uh, mouse and keyboard interfaces for the brain. The way we do that is by training Pedro and, Pedro and his friends on a variety of computer tasks, and then designing algorithms to predict their behavior. Here you can see a few examples of tasks in different phases of monkey training. For example, left and right click, click and drag, cursor typing, swipe typing, handwriting, and even hand gestures. Now, interacting with computer is bidirectional, and feedback is very important. I like when I click on a button and I can physically feel the button being pressed. When a potential N1 user will attempt to click, they won't be able to feel it. An example of how we are uh, addressing that is by providing a real-time visual feedback that represents the strength of the neural click by changing the color of the cursor. Just by typing on a physical keyboard is much faster and easier than typing on an iPad keyboard. This will make the brain control much faster and easier to use. Typing, one of the most important functionalities. So you already seen this message. And I want to show you the behind the scene of how this message was created. And here you can see again Saki using the virtual keyboard, typing this message. This virtual keyboard is similar to the one I use on my phone. And with the speed and accuracy that we achieved so far, typing on a virtual keyboard is already fast and easy. However, I never use a virtual keyboard when I type on my, keyboard, on my computer because it covers my screen, and it's also much slower than what I can do with my 10 fingers. We can do better. For example, a group from Stanford asked a person to make uh -oh. Uh -oh. Imagine, handwriting. imagine handwriting letters. Then they decoded the letters from his brain activity. Using this approach, they were able to speed up the typing, uh, the typing rates. We start this project with our monkeys, but of course they don't know how to write. So to mimic writing, we train Ranger, one of our favorite monkeys, to trace digits on the night. We had two main takeaways from this project. One, that monkeys are awesome and can learn very, very complex tasks. The second one, that although it can increase the typing rate, it requires hundreds of examples and samples of each of the digits and the characters we wanted to classify. This would not scale. The way we are solving that is by indirection. Instead of decoding directly the digits, we first decode the hand trajectory of the uh, on the screen. And then when we decoded the hand trajectory, we can use any off-the-shelf handwriting classifier to predict the digit and the characters. For example, classifiers that are trained on an MNIST dataset. Why it's so important? It's important because now we can potentially decode any character in any language with only one neural decoder for hand trajectory. It means that you can write in English, Hebrew, Mandarin, or even monkey language, and we can understand you want a banana. <laughs> so there are many challenges ahead of us to improve functionality and speed. And I want to hand it off to Bliss to talk about the third part, how we are making our brain interfaces work anytime, anywhere. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Bliss, and I'm a software engineer here at Neuralink. When I use my computer, my mouse and keyboard work how I intend them to, at least like 99.9999% of the time. My goal is to enable a user with paralysis to control their computer as reliably as I can. Here's what we want that experience to feel like. In this video, you can see Saki walking over to his MacBook and choosing to work on his typing task. The entire decoding system works out of the box, and it feels totally plug and play. The first step to achieving this kind of high reliability is to test extensively offline. A typical flow for using the N1 link is to connect over Bluetooth, stream out neural activity from the brain, and then use that neural activity to train decoders and do real-time inference. We've built a simulation for exactly this sequence, but instead of using a monkey with an implant, we use a simulated brain that injects synthetic neural activity into an implant sitting in a server rack. 
from the point of view of that implant, it's in a real brain. This simulation runs on every code commit to validate that from the hardware all the way up through to the neural decoders, our entire stack can achieve state-of-the-art performance. However, while this kind of simulation is great for integration testing of software and hardware, it's not yet detailed enough to guarantee high reliability in the real world. In the real world, the underlying signals we're trying to decode actually change day to day. In this plot, you can see the average firing rate detected on a representative channel of Saki's implant. Each bar represents one day, and you can see that each day has a different average firing rate than the previous. This presents us with a very interesting problem for how to make our decoders robust day to day. It can actually happen that if you train a neural decoder on one day of data and then try to use it on the next, the average firing rates can actually shift enough to cause a bias in the output of the model. Here on the right, you can see that this bias is making it hard for the cursor to move to the upper right corner. You see it struggling here to make it up to the upper right, and then it moves much more effortlessly down to the bottom left. We're trying many approaches to mitigate this problem. Some examples include building models on large data sets of many days of data to try to find patterns in, of neural activity that are stable across days. Another approach we're trying is to continuously sample statistics of neural activity on the implant and use the latest estimates to pre-process the data before feeding it into the model. This is really an active area of research for the team, and it's a critical problem to solve if we want to enable someone with paralysis to control their computer as well as I can. Another big problem we have is to minimize the time it takes for a spike in the brain to impact the movement of the cursor on the screen. If you have lag or jitter in this control loop, the cursor becomes hard to control, leading to the kinds of overshoots that you can see here on the right. One big improvement we've made towards uh, in this direction is called phase lock. Phase lock aligns the edge of each packet that we send off the implant to the exact moment that the Bluetooth radio is going to wake up. This minimizes the time it takes for a spike in the brain to be incorporated into the prediction of our neural network. Here you can see the latency distribution after phase lock. Not only has the mean been greatly reduced, but the variance has been reduced as well. This makes it easier for the user to predict the behavior of their cursor. Over the last year, we've made tremendous improvements to the stability and reliability of our system. And we've been able to demonstrate consistent high performance across many sessions and many months. However, there's still a long road ahead of us before the system will truly feel plug and play. So if solving the hard problems required to ship this technology is exciting to you, you should consider applying to join the team. Now, I'm going to hand it over to Avinash to talk about how our custom low-power ASIC detects spikes in the brain. All right, thank you. This here, Avinash. Hi, I'm Avinash, one of the engineers on the ASIC. Uh-oh. Uh oh. We designed the custom neural sensors, which include both analog and digital circuitry, to record and stimulate across 1,024 independent channels. We face challenges across all three major metrics performance, power, and area. Not only do we have to fit all 1024 channels into a single quarter sized implant, but we also have to measure spiking activity less than 20 microvolts in amplitude. And today, I'd like to focus on the last challenge I mentioned, power. Power consumption is important to us because we want to give future users a full day of use of their implant without any interruption for charging. Back in 2018, we were sending every sample from every channel off the device for processing, which burned a ton of power. In 2020, we brought spike detection onto the chip. As you may know, neurons transmit information by firing. So simply monitoring for these spikes and only sending these spike events off the implant acts as a very efficient form of compression. And over the past two years, we've continued to make optimizations within the ASIC, dropping the total system power consumption down to just 32 milliwatts and doubling battery life. Let's take a look at our on-chip spike detection algorithm, which makes our battery-powered implants possible. We first start by applying a 500 hertz to 5 kilohertz bandpass filter to remove noise that's out of band. Next, we use an estimate of the noise floor to generate an adaptive threshold per channel. And finally, our spike detector module identifies three key points of a spike. 
identifying three points allows us to detect not just the presence of a uh, spike, but the shape of a spike as well. This can be extremely important for distinguishing between multiple neurons adjacent to a single channel. Today, I'd like to focus on one of the many optimizations that we've made in our latest chip. This one specifically cutting system power by 15%. Note that neurons spike relatively infrequently, which means that our spike detector spends a lot of time searching for the first point of a spike and very little time searching for the other two points of a spike that only occur after the threshold is crossed. We can use this characteristic of the input waveform to reduce memory accesses within the chip by 30%. Let's take a look at how that works. Our spike detector is implemented as a single functional unit that's shared across all channels with an SRAM to buffer the state of each channel. As a sample comes in, its channel state is read from SRAM, an incremental spike detection step is run, and then the updated state is written back to SRAM. Since this is happening 20 million times per second across the implant, each of these accesses add up quite quickly. In our latest chip, we split the state into two parts, a hot state and a cold state. The hot state is accessed on every cycle, while the cold state is only accessed once the threshold is crossed, reducing the average access width and saving power. We're also working on a next generation stimulation focused chip with 4,096 channels still within the footprint of our current chips. In addition to increasing the channel count, we're also increasing the drive voltage so we can get better activation per channel. And to support this higher channel count, as well as a broad range of future applications that you'll soon hear about, we're adding an ARM core onto the chip. And finally, since these chips are the same size as our current chips, we can still put four of them together into a single implant for a total of 16,000 channels still within the size of a quarter. That's big. 1,000 to 16,000. As you can see, we've been working very hard to improve the power consumption within the implant. But we've also been working very hard to improve the charging experience of the implant, which Matt will talk about. But first, the robot has just completed inserting all 64 threads. So let's take a look. All right, R1. This is a view of the insertion site, similar to the one that DJ showed you earlier. But instead of the targeting reticles, if you look closely, you can see that all 64 threads, each carrying 16 electrodes, have been inserted into the brain proxy while avoiding vasculature and all just within the past 20 minutes. Let's hand it over to Matt now to continue the technical deep dive. All right, Matt. Tell us, Matt, what you got? Hi, I'm Matt, head of brain interfaces. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Electrical engineering. Our fully implantable N1 device depends on a battery for continuous operation. When that battery is running low, charging is accomplished through wireless power transfer. However, unlike many consumer electronic devices, which can simply offer a physical connector, charging a fully implantable device poses several unique challenges. First, the system must operate over a wide charging volume without relying on magnets for perfect alignment. The system must be robust to disturbance and complete quickly so as not to be overly burdensome. However, most important is safety. In contact with brain tissue, the outer surface of the implant must not rise more than two degrees C. In pursuit of these goals, our charging system has gone through several engineering iterations. The first, uh, if you watched our pig demo in August of 2020, Gertrude was implanted with a version of the N1 charged with our first generation charger. This device was implemented in a small puck package and later separated into a remote coil and battery base. This charger was challenging to use. However, we learned a lot through its implementation. Our current production charger, which charges our current generation of implants, is implemented in an aluminum battery base, which also includes the drive circuitry. A remote coil, four times the size of our original device, also uh, disconnectable, 
uh, this, uh, this remote coil has uh, increased uh, switching frequency, driving improved coil coupling. This charger is in use today, including several applications within our engineering and animal test facilities. That's I'd nervous. like to show you one of these applications here uh, with a device we call our simple charger. And the coil has been embedded into the habitat uh, with the addition of one new outer control loop plus a banana smoothie pump, uh, the troop has been trained to charge themselves. So let's see how Pager charges his implant. On the right, we're streaming real-time diagnostics from Pager's N1. When he climbs up and sits below the coil, you can see the charger automatically detect his presence and transition from searching to charging. We see the regulated power output on a scale of zero to one and the current driven into his battery. Dude, that's freaking freaking. He literally has like a wireless charger in his head. I mentioned earlier that we improved the coil coupling. However, uh, the high quality factor coils exhibit good charging performance over relatively larger distances, but as they're brought uh, closer to the implant, what you see is a peak splitting effect where the, uh, the, the best, uh, highest efficiency power transfer is pushed up into higher frequencies outside of the ISM band required for compliance with regulated uh, radiated emissions. In our next generation charger, we address this problem by the introduction of dynamic tuning shown on the right. This allows us to in real time adjust the resonant frequency of the transmit and receive coils so that we can uh, change their properties just ahead of uh, degraded performance. <laughs> the electrical engineering team is currently engaged in developing a third generation charger. Uh, notable improvements include uh, bi-directional near field communication. Uh, this has allowed us to reduce the control latency and uh, Im improve the uh, thermal regulation. Improved thermal regulation results in faster charge times. And now Julian will tell us about how we test the N1. All right, Matt, you're nervous, but you killed it, bro. You got this. I, I missed much, this guy's Matt. name. My name is Julian, and I lead the embedded Julian. software group on the Brain Interfaces team. So when we started building implants, we had a small manufacturing line, and to collect data from an implant, you would manually walk over with your laptop, you would connect and collect the data of interest. But our goal is to make an ultra safe and ultra reliable implant. And so to do this, we scaled up the manufacturing line, our testing throughput, and data collection capabilities. So firstly, we added a large suite of acceptance tests to the manufacturing line. These test the functionality of each component and the final assembly. Implants coming off the line are then subjected to benchtop testing, accelerated lifetime, and animal models. We then collect data from these implants round the clock. This data is processed by a series of cloud workers and uh, displayed in an aggregate manner. And then finally, all of this information feeds back into our design process and empowers our engineers to answer any question about any implant at any time. I'm now gonna walk you through different parts of this infrastructure, starting off with firmware testing. So the implant contains a small microprocessor running firmware to manage a whole bunch of its operations. And before we release a firmware update, we want to rigorously test it with both unit and hardware in the loop tests, also known as hill tests. So to do a hill test, what you do is you instrument the battery, you instrument the power rails, the microprocessor, and then we connect to each device with a Bluetooth client. And then we walk the devices through various scenarios to test things like power consumption, real-time performance, security systems, fault recovery mechanisms, a lot of different things. In our original implementation of these systems, we used off-the-shelf components to start automating tests quickly. However, these systems were constructed in a relatively artisan fashion and were very difficult to maintain. And this meant that testing quickly became the bottleneck for development. So to alleviate this, the hardware and software teams developed a new system which integrates all the required components onto a single baseboard. We can then put the charger and implant hardware on individual modules that plug into this baseboard, including one board with opposing coils so that we can test charging performance. 
This architecture allows us to rapidly iterate different hardware prototypes because we can simply drop them into this system and reuse all the testing infrastructure. Additionally, we can host the current and next generation of our neural ASICs onto FPGAs and plug those into this board as well. And that allows us to test a whole extra layer altogether. So that's how we generated this rather inceptive image here on the right. What you're looking at is spiking activity emitted from some of our simulated neural sensors streamed through the entire system over Bluetooth and then displayed on a phone. This allows us to test everything in one system from chip to cloud. This system is one fifth the cost, one fifth the volume, and is very easy to manufacture. This allows every developer to have a personal unit on their desk, and it also allows us to test, uh, to shard the entire test suite over a large number of these units mounted into a rack. All of this has greatly accelerated our rate of development. Let's look next at how we monitor the implant's electronics, the battery, and the enclosure. So the implant will periodically capture all of its vital signs and commit those to flash. And then upon next connection with one of our recording stations, it will stream that data off. So for instance, if we look at humidity, we can get an understanding of the integrity of the implant's enclosure. And by looking at battery voltage and power measurements, we can gauge battery health. All of this is done automatically without any intervention, giving us 24 seven visibility into the quality of every single device. Additionally, we can use this infrastructure to request high fidelity information on demand so that we can investigate different uh, anomalous situations. So for instance, in this particular scenario, we were trying to track down the source of some spurious spikes that we were observing on different channels. And so we uh, requested raw wave samples directly from those channels. Capturing good quality neural signals requires intact, low impedance electrodes. And so this is also something we monitor very closely with dedicated circuitry on the neural sensor. So how do we do this? We do this by first using an onboard DAC to play a test tone on a single channel. And then we record using our ADCs simultaneously. We record uh, the response signal on both that, that channel and physically adjacent channels. Not only can we measure the impedance of every channel like this, but we can also map different physical phenomena to different characteristic signatures. So for instance, an open channel will appear as a very large response on the channel, and shorter channels will appear as a large response on neighboring channels. By looking at the purity of the signal coming back, we can also validate that the analog front end of the neural sensor itself is operational. In our original implementation of doing these impedance scans, it took four hours to get through all 1,000 channels. But by paralyzing the tests, downsampling, filtering, and then reducing the amount of information we have to stream off the device by moving a lot of the calculation to the firmware side, we're now able to scan all 1,000 channels in just 20 seconds. This means that we can run impedance on every implant every day. And then our internal dashboards can play back a history of this impedance so that we can get a really good quantitative insight into that interface between biology and electronics. Now that you have an idea about how we test and monitor our implants, we're gonna hand it off to Josh, who's gonna tell you about how we get feedback even faster by accelerating our implants to failure. All right, Josh, come on, let us know what you got. Nice beard, well done. Hello, my name is Joshua Hess, and I'm an engineer <laughs> on the Brain Interfaces team. We are responsible for the implant system design, as well as many of the manufacturing and testing tools. Julian just talked to you a little bit about some of the ways in which we test our implant electronics hardware and software. But what about the entire system as it relates to longevity in tissue? One of the ways we've addressed this is with the development of our in-house accelerated lifetime testing system. The system allows us to expedite and capture long duration implant failure modes at scale to rapidly increase our pace of iteration. Even better, the system also significantly reduces the amount of tests which require animal models, both for implant prototypes and of course, longevity testing. So how does the system work? Well, at a very basic level, it comes down to three things. First, we wanna mimic the internal chemistry of tissue. Next, we want to accelerate these chemical interactions as well as diffusion with our implant materials. And finally, we want to aggressively cycle the internal electronics of our implant. With these things, primarily the first two, 
we have achieved a conservative 4x acceleration factor by the Arrhenius relationship. In other words, every day our implants spend in our accelerated system is equivalent to at least four days spent in vivo. I love how it says the basics at the top. One of our greatest challenges has been the battle against moisture ingress into our implants. So we continuously monitor the internal humidity to watch for abnormal rise. Here in white, you can see some internal humidity data from implants in some of our animals for the duration of over one year. As you can see, our internal humidity sensing is so sensitive, it can even detect the very small and slow humidity rise just from the fusion through our implant materials. Now in blue, you can see that same internal humidity data, but from devices in our accelerated system. Now, if we adjust this data for our acceleration factor, you can begin to see not only the agreement in this data, but also just how far into the future this data extends. Now in red, you can see a device which has failed in our accelerated system. This device showed an abnormal increase in humidity over the duration of many months before implant electronic failures occurred. So how do we build this system? Well, we started building the first system prototype just after the COVID shutdown had begun in early 2020. So we had to get a little creative. As you can see, our first system prototype was a little scrappy and operated out of one of our apartments as indicated by the carpeting. Although scrappy, the system allowed us the fastest path to start testing our devices, tuning our working fluid chemistry, and checking our constraints. We also immediately started group causing observed failures in early implant prototypes, fed that information into the next prototype designs, and literally rinsed and repeated. Over the duration of just a few months, the system was built out totally custom and highly iterated with two system versions and countless minor iterations leading us to our currently operated third generation system, which achieves high density testing with automatic in-vessel charging, as well as automatic data collection. The system also features an implant sled assembly, which accepts brain proxy material, such that the implant can be installed and inserted by the surgical robot, just like you saw a few minutes ago. We also integrated the system into a high density rack mount form factor, along with a centralized fluid management system both for chemical uniformity across vessels and also reduced operational maintenance. The system has been in operation for the last year and a half and has had its fair share of challenges. Since the system itself is undergoing the same accelerated abuse as the implants within it, it has been extremely challenging to design, build, and maintain a system of this scale while keeping it robust, even against itself. So what comes next? Well, we have started work on our fourth generation system and have totally redesigned it from the ground up to be a hot swappable single implant per vessel design, partly inspired by high density compute servers. With this new system, we will achieve a whole new level of density, robustness, and scale. We also intend to have many of these systems operational in the pursuit of capturing even the uh, lowest frequency edge case failure modes. With What's this, we will have thousands of implants testing in pursuit of these goals. We've already started work building out this system, but there is still a lot left to do. There are also many exciting challenges ahead of us, such as introducing mechanical stressing, brain proxy micromotion, and even replicating tissue growth around the threads for more complete and representative accelerated testing. So now that you've heard, some of the ways in which we rigorously test our implant designs before production for surgery. Christine is now going to take you through a detailed look at our surgical process. All right, Christina. Thanks, Josh. First lady of the group. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine, lead of the surgery engineering Christine, team. Christine, sorry. To get an N1 device, it's essentially these steps. Targeting and the incision, drill the craniectomy, Remove the tough outer meningeal layer called the dura. Then insert the thin, flexible threads of electrodes. Place the implant into the hole we created. And then that's it. You've got an implant under the skin. Look, Ma, no wires. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I mean, seriously, no wires, but I don't actually have one. 
such a nerd. The surgical <laughs> robot does the thread insertion part of the surgery. This is because it would be very difficult to do manually. Imagine taking a hair from your head and trying to stick it into a jello covered by saran wrap and doing this at a precise depth and position and doing this 64 times within a reasonable amount of time. And a neurosurgeon would probably not like it very much if we asked them to do this for the surgery. So we have the robot that you saw doing its tiny dance. I sort of wanted to call it Tiny Dancer, but it's called R1, uh, which is also great. The rest of the surgery is done by the neurosurgeon. In order for us to make a accessible and affordable procedure, we need to revisit this. I'll tell you why. When I was in school, my dad lost the ability to walk and to use his arms and even to speak. He was diagnosed with ALS. We would look on the internet and you could see maybe one person here or there who had some cool custom robotic assistive device, but it was deeply frustrating how limited were the options available to him. And there's hundreds of thousands of people with paresis, not even counting people with other conditions that our device might be able to help. Meanwhile, there's not that many neurosurgeons, maybe about 10 per million people. And it takes about a decade or more to train a neurosurgeon and they're already generally very busy. And as you can imagine, their time is very expensive. So in order for us to do the most good and have an affordable and accessible procedure, we need to figure out how one neurosurgeon could oversee many procedures at the same time. This might sound sort of crazy, but probably so did laser eye surgery before LASIK made it normal. LASIK's been around for about 30 years and counting. In the beginning, the laser robot did just the most fundamental core part that it had to do, and the surgeon did the rest. And over the iterations, the surgeon has to do less and less, and the laser robot does most of it. And it's a highly compelling procedure. It takes just a handful of minutes and often gives life-changing results. Since I joined in 2017, we've also done a handful of iterations to optimize the thread insertions of the robot. One of the challenges that we've had to face has to do with the optomechanical packaging. So as you can see here, there's about three primary optical paths that are really valuable for us to have reliable thread insertions. One is the visible imaging of the needle inserting the thread. And then another is the laser interferometry system called OCT, optical coherence tomography, that gives us the precise position of the brain while it's moving in real time. And then also we have to provide lighting and illumination to see what's going on in the visible, uh, visible light camera. And doing all this where the needle is at the bottom of the craniectomy, especially when it's close to the skull wall, can be pretty difficult to fit everything and be able to see it. So the way that the team solved this is by putting all three of these optical paths into one optical stack using photon magic or polarization, whatever you want to call it. And that enables us to do uh, vessel avoidance in real time. So as I mentioned, the brain is moving and where we place targets in the beginning may not be where you want to insert at the moment the needle is going down there. So the robot can actually detect the vessels and then uh, determine if we're going to insert onto a vessel or not, if it's safe to insert. And then that way we can avoid inserting onto major vessels. And that brings us to the robot that we have here today. There's still a lot for us to do to get to that procedure where we reduce the role of the neurosurgeon and make it affordable and accessible. The primary, uh, the two elements of the surgery that demand the most skills from the neurosurgeon are the craniectomy and the directomy. Alex and Sam are going to tell you a bit more about how we think we can get rid of the directomy step. So that leaves the craniectomy. In neurosurgery, if your craniectomy is small enough, you can use a standard tool called a perforator, which makes quick work of this job. But for a larger craniectomy, the surgeon has to rely on their skill in order to accommodate the variability patient to patient in skull thickness, skull hardness. Even within the same patient in the same craniectomy, you can have different skull thicknesses, for example. In addition, if we can make something that has a very high precision craniectomy, we can open the design space for future ways of mounting the implant to the skull. So I'll show you a few of our prototypes. Ultrasonic cutters, like what's on the screen, and oscillating cutters have the benefit of not cutting soft tissue. You can cut the bone and not the brain. But however, as you can see here, our ultrasonic cutter prototype created quite a bit of heat to cut at the rate that we wanted. So 
onto the oscillating saw. Here, we designed a blade to minimize cut time and also conducted sound and also heating. And as you can see, you can cut through hard things like bone, but not soft things like skin. It's simple and it's, it works. However, if you wanted to cut an arbitrary depth or arbitrary shape, the oscillating saw just won't cut it. <laughs> I was afraid no one would get it. You guys are smart. Um, so th there's a time-tested solution a for uh, drilling arbitrary shapes, which is a CNC drill. The challenge with us doing this on a person is that we need to make sure it cuts reliably every single time, doesn't cut too deep. And a few ways that we're using feedback to you know, make sure we don't cut through the brain are force feedback and also impedance. And if I could get a volunteer, no, just kidding. Maybe next time. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, some insight into some of the things we're working on to make an accessible and affordable procedure. And now Alex is going to tell you a bit about our next generation developments. Look, Ma, no wires. All right, Christine. Get her on a stage, some stand up. Thanks, Christine. I'm Alex. I'm a mechanical engineer here on the robotics team. Now that we've covered the technology and surgical process for a current device, we'd like to cover some of our next generation development projects. I and the next couple speakers would like to talk about one of those projects, which is enabling device upgradability. You've gotten to hear about the advancements we've made over the past year. We've improved implant robustness, battery and charging performance, Bluetooth usability. Realistically, every new device version is going to be significantly better. It'll be more functional, it'll last longer. We need to keep this new technology accessible for our early adopters. This means that we need a solution to make device upgrade or replacement just as easy as it is to initially install. As many medical device companies have found, this is a challenging problem. The body's healing response doesn't make this easy, so this isn't solved yet. But we've made significant progress towards enabling this, that we'd like to cover today. Now, we'll have to start with some background as to what makes device upgrade challenging. And we'll start with the anatomy. Under the skin, you have the skull. Below that, the dura, a tough membrane that separates the bone from the brain. And between the dura and the brain, you have the pioarachnoid complex, a fluid-filled suspension for the brain. To install the device, the surgeon removes a disc of skull and dura to expose the brain surface. All empty volume is filled by tissue, encapsulating the device and the threads. The device would be trivially easy to remove. Because of the thread's small size, they would have slipped right out of the brain. It's the tissue layer that forms above the surface that makes the removal challenging. We've built tools in-house to study this response and characterize it, such as histology and micro-CT. In these images, you can see that layer of tissue that has formed above the surface, encapsulating the threads and adhering to the surrounding tissue. We've explored many different avenues for designing around this healing process and finding a solution to make device upgrades seamless. Our best successes have come from making the procedure less invasive. Instead of directly exposing the brain's surface, we instead keep the dura in place, maintaining the body's natural protective barrier. This prevents encapsulation at the brain's surface. And really, this is actually a huge win for making the surgery simpler and safer, as Christine alluded to. However, this doesn't come for free. The dura is a very tough, opaque membrane. As you can see in these SEM images, it's composed of a dense network of collagen fibers. These offer an array of technical challenges for inserting our electrodes. One of those challenges is imaging through the dura. As you can see on the left, our current custom optical systems offer pretty incredible capabilities for imaging the exposed brain surface. However, as you can see on the right, once the dura is in place, you can't see the dense vasculature at the brain surface. The dura is in the way. There's simply too much attenuation. To solve this problem, we're developing a new optical system that uses a medical standard fluorescent dye to image vessels underneath the tissue. Here, 
you can see that dye perfusing through the vessels, highlighting them. Mm. There's still a lot of work, engineering work to go to prove accuracy and repeatability of this system. But once that's done, this will allow us to target and avoid blood vessels underneath the dura. Mm. We're also exploring applying our laser imaging system to deeper tissue structures. In the bottom left, you can see a section of the tissue layers underneath the dura. This image is compiled from multiple volumes from our optical coherence tomography system. You can see the collage of those volumes above. In the future, these new systems, when combined with correlation to pre-op imaging, such as MRI, will enable precise targeting without directly exposing the brain surface. Now, imaging isn't the only challenge that comes with a tough dural anatomy. Now, I'd like to hand it over to Sam to talk about some of the challenges of inserting our electrodes through this membrane. All right, Sam. Tell us more, Sam. Thanks, Alex. Hey, I'm Sam, and I lead the needle manufacturing and design team. So as Alex mentioned, the same properties of the dura that make it a good protector of the brain also make it really difficult for us to insert the threads into. In humans, the dura can be over a millimeter in thickness, which doesn't sound like a lot, but compared to our 40 micron needles, it actually is a lot. For example, if you scaled up the needles to the size of a pencil, the dura would scale to over four inches in thickness. Take a look at how far you have to zoom in to even see it. By the time the features of the needle come into frame, you could see individual red blood cells in the same frame. This is, this is, just wait. <laughs> um, this is a real life SEM image of our latest design. Uh, on the left there, you can see the end of the thread. In the middle is the needle, and on the light is actually a piece of my hair. Um, so yeah, it's extremely small. Um, and besides being really small, there's a lot of other challenges associated with designing this. Um, one challenge is that we have to use the needle and the ca protective cannula that it sits in to grab onto the thread and to hold it while we peel it from this protective silicon backing. And then we have to keep holding it while we bring it over to the surface and then release it from the cannula during insertions. Another challenge is that the brain is really soft beneath the tough dura. And so if the needle isn't sharp enough, it'll just keep dimpling the surface without puncturing. And if this free length gets too long, it can actually just buckle the needle like this. Another challenge is that we don't just have to get the needle through, we have to get the thread through as well. Uh, so we really have to focus on optimizing the combined profile of the needle and thread together. And these are just some of the challenges associated with designing something like this. And so far we found that the key to solving this problem has been improving on our speed of iteration. But let's look at how we make these things in the first place. So we start with a length of 40 micron wire made out of tungsten and alloyed with a little bit of rhenium for added ductility. We designed this femtosecond laser mill in-house to cut the features of the needle and cannula. And it can do this with sub-micron precision. We spent a lot of time this year turning this thing from a science project into an industrial system. Just a couple months ago, it took a skilled operator 22 minutes to make a needle. And even a skilled operator could only get about 58% yield. Today, that same process takes just six minutes, and anyone can get 91% yield with just a few minutes of training. With only one click, the mill cuts and measures the needle and cannula and uploads the measurements to our limb system so that the robots can use the exact dimensions for each needle that it uses. Now, this is all for our current design, though. And we've had a couple years to optimize the manufacturing process of it. The current design has served us well so far, but um, it doesn't quite protect the thread well enough to get through the tough dura. So like I said, we had to come up with something new, and we needed to be able to iterate on designs quickly. Unsurprisingly, there's no page in machinery's handbook for this kind of thing, so we dug into the science of femtosecond laser ablation and figured out a workflow that allows us to use our laser mill much right. like a CNC mill. This allows us to iterate several times, this allows us to iterate in under an hour for new designs, allowing several iterations per day when we're really on a roll. As a result, the latest design, seen on the right, can actually insert through nine layers of dura totaling uh, three millimeters on the bench top. This is far more than we could ever expect in a human with significant margin. Super needle. The needle isn't the only part of the puzzle, though. As you can imagine, all of these designs here work with different threads. So we need a way to iterate on that as well. 
And we do this by having our microfabrication process here in-house. This summer, we completely rebuilt our clean room in about nine weeks, which, among other things, greatly reduced particulate counts, which allows yield and throughput to greatly increase. This, combined with all the other great improvements the microfab team has made, allows us to iterate on new designs in just a matter of days. The last piece of the puzzle, though, is testing. We can come up with as many new designs as we want, but unless we have a way to actually test them in the right conditions, we won't know what to tweak. Or even worse, we'll spend time optimizing for the wrong things. Take this failure mode, for example. Um, a few months ago, we got to the point where we could pretty reliably insert through the Dura. But when we took the proxies and put them in our micro CT imaging, we realized that our hold on the end of the threads was actually too strong. And we were pulling them out just a little bit underneath the surface. By the time we solved the problem, we realized that this issue was very sensitive to the properties of the surrounding material or tissue. We could make a proxy where this never happens, and we could make another proxy where this happened every single time. And this highlights why it's crucial that we spend time making our benchtop tests match tissue as accurately as possible. And I'm going to pass it off to Leslie now, who's going to talk about how we've been doing that. Thanks. All right. Leslie? Let's hear it. Hi. I'm Leslie, and I lead microfabrication R&D. Part of what we're interested in is understanding the biological environment our implant and threads experience once they're fully installed in the body. Learning directly from biology, though, is inherently slow. So in order to move fast, we're developing synthetic materials that mimic the biological environment. This allows us to learn as much as we can on benchtop and start taking steps away from the industry standard of animal testing. Developing accurate proxies, though, is challenging. The implant environment is made up of many anatomical layers that all have unique properties. And as time goes on and the implant site heals, new tissue forms filling any available space. In addition to that, motion related to cardiovascular activity and head movement introduce added complexity. So to start addressing some of these challenges, we're engineering materials using feedback from biology. This may involve mechanical characterization of tissue or analysis of interactions at thread tissue interfaces. Much of this characterization is even done during surgery itself by using custom hardware and software that modifies our surgical robot to double up as a sensitive characterization tool. We then use the data collected and feed it back into optimizing our materials so that they behave mechanically, chemically, and as shown here, structurally, just like biology. We've come a long way from our humble first brain proxy shown here sitting on a plate and consisting of agar and a parafilm sheet. And while simple, it allowed us to perfect robot insertions through countless bench shop tests. Today, our proxy is slightly more complex, where we've upgraded to a composite hydrogel-based brain proxy that better mimics the modulus of real human brain. We've also incorporated a Dura proxy and devel developed an injectable soft tissue proxy that so far has allowed us to perform benchtop mock explant testing. We have a super long wish list for our proxy of the future, but some of those items include a surgery proxy with integrated soft tissue, brain, bone, skin, or even a whole body, a brain proxy that simulates motion, vasculature, and electrophysiological activity, and a biological proxy to test biocompatibility and electrical stimulation. There's a ton of ongoing work getting us closer to our proxy of the future, including work on lab-grown cerebral organoids, as shown here. And all of this will get us closer to a future where we learn more and iterate faster on benchtop and reduce our reliance on animal models, or even one day, replace them completely. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dan, who will be presenting a very exciting next generation application. Thank you. All right, Dan, let's hear it. Good job, Leslie. Thank you, Leslie. My name's Dan, and I came to work at Neuralink after following a career in visual neuroscience research. I was inspired to join this company because I saw in our device the potential to restore vision to people rendered blind by eye injury or disease. 
There are a number of particular characteristics of our device that make it uniquely suited to this application. Firstly, as well as being able to record from every channel, we can stimulate neural activity in the brain by injecting current through every channel. This is important because it allows us to bypass the eye and generate a visual image in the brain directly. Secondly, our device can have an enormous number of electrodes. For a visual prosthesis, this is important because the more electrodes you can have, the higher density of an image you can create in the brain. Thirdly, thanks to our robot, we can insert these electrodes deeply into the brain. Now, this is an important thing for a visual prosthesis because the human visual cortex is buried deeply in a fold in the medial face of the brain called the calcarine sulcus. In this image, I've highlighted the calcarine sulcus in red in an MRI. It contains a map of the visual world, the visual field. It's about the surface area equal to a credit card on each side. And if you unfold it and flatten it, you see that the image is inverted, it's upside down. But more interestingly, it's, mag it's distorted so that the central part of the visual field, the fixation point, is greatly magnified. So for example, if you look at this image of Lincoln, if you look directly into his right eye, everything to the left of that fixation point is directed to your right visual cortex, and everything to the, to the right goes to your left visual cortex. His eye, even though it's very small in the image, is magnified in the brain to occupy nearly a, a quarter of the surface area of the visual cortex. Over the last half century, visual neuroscientists have developed a profound understanding of visual processing in the brain. What's driven most of this research is recording from single cells in the cortex, usually of macaque monkeys. One of the seminal discoveries was that every cell in the visual cortex represents only a tiny part of the visual field. Your perception is made up of a mosaic of tiny receptive fields, each belonging to a single cell in your visual cortex. So if you record from one of these cells in a monkey, say, in this location, you can find a very tiny region of the screen where a light stimulus will cause modulation of that neuron. Another location in visual cortex will have a location elsewhere on the screen, in this case in the lower visual field. These regions are called receptive fields. We've inserted our device into the visual cortex of two rhesus monkeys, whose names are Code and Dash. That means we can record activity from their visual cortex generated by their, nor their normal home environment as they roam around. But as we all know, monkeys love banana smoothie. That means we can easily teach them to fixate points on a screen and reward them. We can reward them very precisely because we can track the location of their eye using an infrared camera. One of the things this allows us to do is to plot the receptive fields for every neuron that we can record with a single device. Now we do this by showing the animal a movie of random checkerboards whilst he fixates steadily on the screen. Then we take only the frames of the movie that generated a response in the cell and average them all together. This is a technique known as reverse correlation. It's generally used quite widely in, in visual neuroscience for this purpose. And this is an example of a receptive field plotted with this technique. The central cross is the fixation point, and you can see the little red and blue regions, citatory and inhibitory receptive field. These regions give cortical cells some of their characteristic properties. So we can record all the receptive fields from all the electrodes at the same time. And if we take all these receptive fields and accumulate them together, overlap them, and place them on a on a computer monitor for scale at a typical viewing distance, you begin to get an idea of how much of the visual field we can cover with this preliminary device. Many of the receptive fields are close to the fovea, to close to the fixation point. And that's partly due to the magnification that I talked about of the fovea. But there's also a scattering of fields in the periphery. These are from uh, recording sites deeper in the brain in the calcarine sulcus.
so far, I've only talked about recording information from the cortex. But to produce a visual prosthesis, we need to stimulate. So if we stimulated the cells whose receptive fields are in this location, we would produce a perception of a flash in that location that only the monkey can see. How do we know that the monkey sees it? How do we know what it looks like? Well, unfortunately, we can't ask them what they see, but we can train them to tell us something about that phosphine. We start by training the monkey to fixate a central point on the screen, like this white dot, and we start by presenting real visual stimuli on the screen and rewarding the monkey for making eye movements toward those stimuli. So here we flash a white dot, and the monkey makes an eye movement towards it, symbolized by the green arrow. We then choose another random location and reward the monkey for, for making an eye movement towards it. Once he's got good at this task, we can begin to interleave these real stimuli with electrical stimulation of electrodes and produce a phosphor. The monkey sees the flash and naturally makes a saccade towards it. This tells us not only where in the visual field the flash occurred, but we can also change the current that we inject in that electrode to see how often he makes that saccade unnoticeable or how big perhaps the stimulation phosphine is that we're producing. Let's look at code performing this task. I want to show you first at one quarter speed, uh, there's a visual flash and he makes an eye movement towards it. We, the monkey can only see what is white on this screen. He can't see his own eye movement and he can't, certainly can't see when we stimulate. But here we stimulate and he makes the same saccade to the same location because we stimulated the same electrode. Nothing appears on the screen at that time and he has no other cue to make that eye movement. Let me show you this in real time. You can see monkey, monkeys like to work very quickly. And when we stimulate, he makes that saccade in real time. That's kind of freaking awesome, huh? It's like, screw that, I'm done. And it looks like he's had enough. So what I've shown you is a way to produce a phosphine in the visual field. This is not something new in visual neuroscience. But if you think about that phosphine as a single pixel in a visual image, all we need to do is scale up and produce a great many more pixels and have them covering the visual field. This is a schematic of what a visual prosthesis using our N device might, N1 device might look like. A camera, the output from a camera, would be processed by an iPhone, for example, which would then stream the data to the device and the image would be converted into a pattern of stimulation of the electrodes into visual cortex. With a thousand electrodes, we might be able to produce an image resembling something that you see there on the right. But as Avanesh told you, our next generation of the device will have 16,000 electrodes. If you put a device on both sides of your visual cortex, that would give you 32,000 points of light to make an image in someone who's blind. Our goal will be to turn the lights on for someone who's spent decades living in the dark. That's awesome. That's freaking awesome. That is so awesome, seriously. Thanks very much. I'll pass you over to Joey, who's now going to talk about another very exciting application of our device. All right, Joey. Thank you, Dan. So my name is Joey, I'm a neuroengineer, and I'm the head for the next gen team at Neuralink. So for persons with spinal cord injury, the connection between the brain and the body is severed. The brain continues functioning normally, but it's unable to communicate with the outside world. You've already heard about how we can use the N1 link as a communication prosthesis to help someone with spinal cord injury control a computer or a phone, but it can also be used to reanimate the body. Let me show you how. First, a little neuroanatomy. Movement and tensions arise in motor cortex and are sent down long nerve fibers through the spinal cord. These are upper motor neurons. In the spinal cord, they synapse, that is, make a connection with another mo motor neuron, a lower motor neuron, which sends these movement and tensions to the muscles, which contract, and in turn, you have movement. 
While of course there are many other circuits involved in voluntary movement, you can think about the spinal cord as many pairs of these two connections. And in spinal cord injury, one of these connections is severed, unable to make the muscles contract. Let's zoom a little bit further. So here you can see on the left a cross, a cross section of the spinal cord with a fiber coming down schematically. This travels through the white matter tracts. This is the upper motor neuron. And then it synapses within this butterfly-shaped region of gray matter in what's known as a motor pool. In the motor pool, the lower motor neuron descends out the ventral roots to the muscles, which contract. And then the sensory consequences of those movements, for example, the touch of your hand against an object, return to the spinal cord through the dorsal roots and ascend the spinal cord up into the sensory regions of the brain. Again, in spinal cord injury, this connection is severed. If we could place electrodes into the spinal cord, say in a motor pool adjacent to lower motor neurons, we could stimulate those neurons, activating them, and in turn causing the muscle to contract and movement to occur. But this is very hard to do. The spinal cord is quite delicate and it moves significantly within the bony spinal canal. This could cause damage to the electrode, it could cause damage to the tissue, or both. But our electrodes are small and flexible, and our robot is able to insert them deep into tissue, perhaps all the way down into the ventral horn of the spinal cord. And so, we have done just that. Here you can see a view from the R1 robot it's a targeting view, and we've placed electrodes across many millimeters of the spinal cord. And the, the R1 robot is able to insert those electrodes deep into the ventral horn, into motor pools, in very close proximity to lower motor neurons. This is important because it allows them to have a localized uh, connection to those neurons and activate very precise movements. Now, to track movement, it's very common to use motion capture markers, like you might see in the production of a movie. These can be placed with a light adhesive, and you can see me placing these on my hand. We're going to use these markers to let us zoom in on movement in the next couple of slides. OK, so here's a pig walking on a treadmill. And you may have seen something like this before in a previous uh, Neuralink presentation. But unlike before, this pig has more than one Neuralink device. There's a device in the brain, but there's also one in the spinal cord. And we can stream neural data from this device, these devices, in real time and use them to do things like decode the movement of the joints of the pig. So here you can see on the left a time series of the hip, knee, and ankle, and we're decoding uh, those, those movements. So this is super cool, but that's actually not what we want to do. We want to go in the other direction. We would like to stimulate the spinal cord and cause movement to occur. OK, so let's do that. So here's a pig, uh, a happy and healthy pig, doing what pigs like to do, which is root around for food and snacks. And as you'll see on the floor, there's a blue square. Uh, this is a voluntary engagement zone where the pig places itself, uh, indicating that it's comfortable to receive st stimulation. When it's in this zone, we stimulate. And if the pig leaves the zone, we'll stop stimulating. Uh, and as before, you can see we're able to track the position of the joints and also stream neural data as well. OK, so let's stimulate an electrode. So here's one electrode on one thread that when we stimulate causes a flexion movement of the leg. So on the left, you can see the movement of the joints. And you can also see the time series of the stimulation pattern in yellow. So the leg is moving up. Here's another electrode, which when we stimulate causes an extensor movement. This is actually a little harder to see because the leg is straightening and the hips are shifting. But if you look carefully, you can see how uh, this is, uh, the, the leg is moving. We can stimulate on a great variety of threads and produce different movements and actually sequence them spatial temporally to provide patterns. So on the left, you can see a time series of different stimulation on different electrodes. You can see the movements of the joints. And on the right, we're zooming in on muscle activity that gives us an idea of the kind of strength and power and specificity of those uh, movements as well. So in addition to doing sequences, we can also achieve sustained movement. These are powerful muscle contractions of the sort that you might need for standing or other load-bearing activities and are really crucial for interacting through the world. OK, so stimulating the spinal cord is only one piece of the story. You also have to get like command signals for the stimulation of the spinal cord. Unfortunately, we have a way to do that. We have the N1 link that you've already heard about placed in motor cortex. How would that work? So we place threads in motor cortex and record spikes. These spikes would be wirelessly transmitted in real time and decoded into patterns of stimulation. 
Stimulation would then be delivered to the ventral horn of the spinal cord, to the appropriate uh, motor pool for the muscles that we'd like to activate. We then stimulate, activate those lower motor neurons, which causes the muscles to contract and movement to occur. Now, of course, movement without sensation is actually kind of difficult. Just think about what it would be like to try to move your limbs if they're numb. But we can also get sensory information as well. So the sensory consequences of your movement can be recorded in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord in the form of spikes. For example, here, a feather touching the hand. These spikes can in turn be uh, decoded in real time, sent to patterns of stimulation to either the same N1 device in the brain or perhaps a different one in a sensory area. Stimulation of that part of the brain would cause percepts of touch and proprioception, closing the loop. So putting those two loops together, we have motor intentions decoded from the brain used to stimulate the spinal cord, causing movement, and then the sensory consequences of those actions being recorded in the spinal cord to stimulate the brain, uh, causing perception. Now, we have a lot of work to do to achieve this full vision, but I hope you can see how the pieces are all there to achieve this. And if you find this prospect as exciting to you as it is to me, I hope you'll consider joining us here at Neuralink. Thank you. All right. Probably Q&A now. Impressive roster, man. Very impressive roster. Get your mic, bro. What are you doing? So unprepared. I want that shirt. <laughs> He's so confused. Look at him. <laughs> really impressive presentation. We should get a, a stand up comedy from Christine as an encore. Thank you. This is, this is obviously amazing and has clear therapeutic potential. Um, it would also be great for the scientific neuroscience community to access some of these tools. Do you have any plans to make these available to neuroscientists? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, no, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I think there's probably a lot that, that can be figured out uh, if we provide the uh, surgical robot and devices to neuroscience uh, research uh, departments at universities and hospitals. Uh, so I think the point at which we have, uh, we need to be in production with the machines and obviously have the FDA approvals, but I think uh, it would make a lot of sense to provide this to uh, research universities and hospitals. Can't hear her. So the so question is: uh, how, of, of the data that we uh, of the data sets yeah. that you've collected, um, are there any that you plan to open source for the scientific community? Yeah, I think that would be that would be fine. I think, uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Because I think it could be really interesting for people uh, working in AI research um, to build upon that um, and know and build foundation models for the brain. Yeah, that's a, it's a good point. Yeah, I actually have no problem with uh, just publishing it on our website. You can use it if you want. Yeah, looking forward. Great. Thank you. So thank you for the very wonderful presentation. So I have one question. So as we all know, for implantable electrode, either for stimul stimulation or recording, uh, after we implant the electrode, the scar tissue will grow around the electrode. And uh, especially for uh, recording, the signal we get will become smaller and smaller after long-term uh, implant. Uh, how do you solve this issue? Uh, so, uh, for context, I'm Zach. I lead the microfabrication team on brain interfaces. Uh, I don't think we can solve it specifically, but uh, one thing, one advantage we have is both the flexibility and the small size of our threads uh, to try to limit that scar tissue and that damage. And uh, some future work that we have started working on that we'll continue working on is pushing the size of the threads down um, just to try to limit the immune response and uh, 
really limit that scar tissue growth. Uh, actually, I want to follow up. So do you think it will be helpful to actually load some drug on, on the surface of the electrode or some other way? Well, I think like maybe the just the question is like what like, what what sort of signal degradation have we seen over time, um, and uh, you know basically just does it does it work a year later? Does it work two years later? Um, it it does. So yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's a good point. So <clears throat> in terms of thread longevity specifically, um, really the gold standard that we can use to assess is the data we have from our animal participants, uh, and so for that uh, I'm not sure if it was mentioned before, but uh, the longest data we have right now is for uh, an animal participant who has 600, went 600 days with useful functioning channels where we were doing uh, something useful with the, the signals for BCI. Uh, and then with the newest version of our device, we have uh, sort of a collection of participants who are at or near one year of data and uh, completely useful functioning BCI from that as well. Thank you. If I may add one more thing. So you mentioned uh, potentially having drugs to kind of reduce inflammation. Um, so one of the things that we are actually actively working on is having some sort of biological coating to either reduce inflammation or make them slippery. So, you know, you mentioned, uh, you heard from the presentation that one of the challenges that we have is removing uh, the threads from these neomembrane tissue that are formed after implantation. So there are programs like that where we're really looking at kind of incorporating some of the learnings from biology and these um, coatings into our threads so that uh, we can hopefully reduce uh, inflammation as well as make it easier to extract. Yeah, we're also uh, continuing to reduce the size of the, the electrode. So um, as a, when the electrode gets really small, there's um, the, the sort of inflammation response or uh, scar tissue becomes minuscule. So it's like a very, a very tiny electrode the body basically ignores. This is really impressive. Congrats to the whole team. Um, so as, as you, of course, know, one of the problems with current electrodes is they're rigid and they move around, so you have these neural non-stationarities. And I think many of us had hoped that with these yeah. very thin threads, they would maybe move more with the brain and you wouldn't see that. But from the data you showed uh, over many hundreds of days, there was a lot of variability. So can you speak to how much do they move and do you have any idea of like why does it move? Can you stop it from moving? Is like, How stable are, are the signals hour to hour and day to day? Hi, I'm Bliss. I'm one of the leads of the software groups in the Brain Interfaces team. Um, in the particular plot you were mentioning before, what we were showing was the average firing rate recorded per day on a particular channel. It's, as you well know, <laughs> pretty complicated to understand if you're recording from the exact same neuron day after day after day. It could be, for example, that you're actually picking up a different neuron day to day, and that's why you get the change in firing rate. We don't think this is at least the majority cause of the situation here. Uh, the reason is that if you look at sort of the spike shapes day to day, even when the average firing rate is shifting a lot, you still see sort of stable spike shapes. Um, that's obviously not a fully bulletproof story, but at least gives some confidence that uh, it's not actually different neurons breaking up. However, there's still there's very much a chance that that could be the case in at least some part of the of the robustness non stationarity story. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. For the question. Yeah. To be, to be clear, that like this electrode position is actually fairly stable. Um, because you, you've got these very tiny, basically very tiny wires with with uh, that, and, and there, there's some play in the in, in, like you've got you've got the device attached to the skull originally, but then you've got this this long sort of tiny wire with kind of a uh, a coiled section. So it's a uh, it does tend to basically stay in the same place. Yep. We also ask for questions on Check the their website, Twitter, so we'll Thank be you. interleaving some of those. Uh, Supe wants to ask, what could Neuralink help people with that most people don't realize? Well, I mean, so um, once you're in there, you know, uh, <laughs> there's a lot you could do. Um, so, um, you know, you can obviously measure temperature. So you could do very early detection of a fever. Uh, you could you not measure uh, pressure. Uh, I think you, you, you probably detect that uh, um, at the very early, the very beginnings of a stroke. Because um, you can see sort of like electrical signals starting to go sort of haywire. Um, so there's actually probably a lot of um, just general health monitoring that you could do once you're in there, you know, and, and with, with 
very simple sensors. Hi, um, you guys all did a great job of distilling a lot of complex engineering and science and making it wonderfully clear. So great job. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the stimulation, I guess, for the phosphines and for the, the evoked movement. Um, how are you, are you think, is this more like local stimulation? Is it, or is it juxtacellular? Are you steering current around? How many cells are you activating? How much current are you using? I'm just curious what the scale of this is and whether you have a lot of precision or a lot of, you know, you have pretty profound behavioral effects too. Hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Dan. And, um, how many cells you stimulate with a single electrode uh, is dependent on the impedance of the electrode, size of the conductive pad, how much current you deliver, the frequency, all these factors. So there's a great deal of variability that we can use to customize the, the shape of a phosphine or the, not the shape necessarily, but maybe the, the um, intensity of a phosphine. Um, we think with our current electrodes, at least in code, Back of the envelope calculation would be something like about a 50 to 100 micron diameter sphere of cells are being stimulated. Um, in a visual system, the smaller that sphere, uh, the smaller and more specific you can make uh, a particular phosphine. Uh, basically, the, the smaller the pixel in, in the image you can produce. So there's, there's plenty of scope for customization of that. Uh, there's actually also it's possible to get to a much higher like uh, effective pixel count by um, controlling the, the, the field, electric field, between the electrodes. So uh, it's not necessarily, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. You can um, actually um, uh, dynamically adjust the, 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 the field um, and simulate far, have a, have a hot, very high uh, neuron to electrode ratio. So try to, you know, like, could you get like, you know, maybe, maybe 10 to one, 100 to one, potentially. So, so you know, megapixel type type. I mean, basically, can you see it normally? <laughs> I think people would want to know that. And I think that is one of the one of the possible outcomes. Hi, Lon. This is amazing. Uh, can you talk about the longevity of the implant itself? Also, how would the material of the implant would react with the brain tissue or density of the bone or bone structure? Thank you. Yeah, happy to talk about this. I'm Jeremy, uh, an engineer on the Brain Interfaces team. And I, I think it's good to start with data. So like Zach mentioned, we have an implant that was, you know, a monkey was performed BCI for 617 days. That was pager before being upgraded to the latest device. Uh, for our current version of the device, it's lasted for uh, almost a year. And then it, for our accelerated lifetime tester that Josh kind of talked about, we have data from our implants from the previous version, eight years of accelerated time, and from the current version, four years of accelerated time and counting. So that's kind of starting with the data. Um, those devices are still lasting and still going. Um, theoretically, there are kind of three fundamental factors that contribute to the longevity of the device. One is going to be the seal, the hermetic enclosure of the device. Two is going to be the battery and internal electronics. And then three is going to be the threads that Zach talked about a little bit. Um, and the channels being able to functionally record signals from the brain. Uh, the seal, we think, will far outlast the other two in terms of the bottlenecks. So the seal, just theoretically, uh, I think Josh mentioned that it is a thermoplastic polymer material. So there's going to be a very small amount of moisture that diffuses through it um, over time. And we think that that will last you know, 20 plus years easily in terms of just that property. Um, and like I said, we have not seen our seals fail with our current version of the device yet. So we haven't really pushed the limits here. Um, for the battery and internal electronics, uh, that's really based on usage and how much runtime you want. And we are working currently on getting data to project out even farther, but right now, we believe that we can, uh, you know, achieve 80% runtime at the three-year time point, um, which would be about, you know, three and a half hours for a four-hour runtime. But we're, like Avinash mentioned, we're we're doubling that uh, very soon and quadrupling as well. We have plans to do that. So, uh, the internal electronics really aren't the bottleneck either. And so, really, we're attacking the threads themselves and longevity of those channels. That Zach, Zach can kind of talk about some of the improvements that we're doing to increase that longevity. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, as sort of mentioned before, um, we don't necessarily have an endpoint, as Jeremy said, for uh, the testing of the threads. That being said, we are focusing on longevity because we think this is an important uh, issue to solve. Uh, so, one thing that we're doing in parallel with the current device is aggressively pursuing uh, silic amorphous silicon carbide insulation of the threads, which we believe will take us well beyond five years uh, of longevity, but of course, still to be tested. 
Uh, and in parallel with that, we're just starting to uh, look at atomic layer deposition, uh, which we think could even push the longevity of the threads much further and uh, deposit very thin layers to keep the flexibility of the threads uh, and that advantage there. Uh, so um, along with that, we're also, of course, having to design and validate very robust benchtop testing to model uh, really in vivo conditions and look at channel degradation. Uh, so that's what we're looking at for longevity of the threads. And then I think you asked about biocomp. Uh, and I think for biocomp, uh, essentially all the materials we're using right now, um, I can say are at least biostable and we send out testing for biocompatibility uh, very often. And essentially what we're doing is we're using, uh, in many cases, known materials from literature uh, that academic labs have already uh, started to look at and sort of jumping on that and using that as a starting point. Thanks for answering that. Cool. So we have a, another question from Twitter. This is from David. And he asked the team, what are the biggest lessons you learned since the previous presentation? It's been about two years. I'm sure there was a lot of engineering done. Um, so yeah, anyone want to answer what we learned in the last two years? So uh, one thing that we've learned in the last couple of years is just how much the brain moves um, on, on the human scale compared to you know, when you start small, when you make brain proxies, and a lot of research starts with rodents, the brain does not move that much. And when you get a human, and the brain can move like hundreds of microns or more. Um, and when our threads and needles are so small, that motion, when you zoom in, looks like a mile. I think to add to that, um, one thing is how, I guess, dynamic the implant environment actually is. So we've talked about like when the implant site heals, scar or new tissue might grow and fill in the space. And um, that'll affect like how our threads might interact in that space. So that's why we've emphasized so heavily the importance of designing accurate proxies. So instead of having to wait months for um, an implant site to heal, can hopefully learn that information in hours. I'm Alex on the robotics team. I think one of the things we've definitely learned within the engineering teams is the importance of really continuous validation and testing where we're building, say, motion systems that are precise to single digit microns. We need validation and test systems that we trust even more than that to prove that they work reliably and putting just as much focus into those validation and test systems and Designing those alongside our products, I think, is one thing we've definitely learned. I think another thing that we learned, I think, as part of BCI or the brain control and algorithm, is that again, building a prototype and making it work with only one monkey, one pager, was a great maybe a success, but also relatively easy to making it work every day for all the other monkeys. So actually making it a product is something uh, that uh, it's not easy, but we are learning how to do it. I mean, I've learned that the brain is really squishy. <laughs> like way squishier than you think. It's not like, uh, you know, cauliflower or broccoli or something like that. It's more like water balloon. Uh, and then it's moving in your skull like a lot. <laughs> so got a squishy water balloon in a coconut is maybe a good way to think of it. Hello. Um, given Bluetooth's bandwidth limitations, have you considered other technologies for wireless communication? Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, I can take the first part of this question, and then I'll let Matt answer the second part of it. Um, it's a great question. Uh, especially as you think about how to increase and scale the number of channels that we want to record from, this becomes uh, increasingly a bottleneck for the kinds of work that we want to do. Uh, we're thinking about this in a couple ways. One is just directly improving the underlying radio interfaces, and I'll let Matt talk about that in a second. The other way we're thinking about this is how can you be more efficient with the data you send off the implant? And I think the first version of that is compression. So just taking your data, looking at the characteristics of it, find out a way to represent it more efficiently and just send off that compressed stream. So for reference right now, our Bluetooth bandwidth is around 150 kilobytes per second. Uh, the compressed stream of data that we send off the implant is around 50 kilobytes per second. So we're doing fairly well there so far. But when you start thinking about 16,000 channel devices, that won't get you all the way there. So some other things that can help on the compression side are to actually just send out the output of the machine learning model rather than the input required to actually run it. 
Uh, so one thing we've been trying in the background here is called decode on head, which is essentially taking the machine learning models that right now we're running on MacBooks that our monkeys are gaming on and moving those to actually run on the implant. And this is like a super cool engineering problem. If you want to talk about how to make uh, complex neural networks run on what is the equivalent of a garage door opener, come talk to me. It's fun. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's another way to solve this problem is to basically do the, the computationally intensive work to just get the raw signal that you actually yeah. care to use to control something and then send that thing out to the, uh, the implant. On the radio side, I'll hand it over to Matt. Yes, so to answer your question, we are looking at other radio technologies. Um, one in particular is a uh, 500 megahertz band with ultra wideband at a uh, couple different uh, frequencies. So this has an advantage in terms of the bit rate that you can achieve. It's um, on the order of six to eight to 10 megabit. Uh, there's also a latency improvement that is quite substantial. And uh, there's also a, another wireless technology that we're looking at uh, at W band. <laughs> you just right. uh, thank you all for really clear and compelling presentations. Um, something that struck me in one of the earliest talks, I think it might have been BJ's, was this vision for the ability to acquire new complex skills via these BCIs, um, like the ability to perform Kung Fu. Um, and that reflects the fact that the brain is fundamentally a learning machine. And yet, the um, many of the technical solutions presented later framed, were framed um, in such a way as to try to correct for the way the brain changes over time, over longer time scales, um, drift over the course of days, or um, uh, the way that the tissue might heal over time. I was curious what your vision collectively was for developing out this technology that interfaces with a fundamentally plastic system that changes in complex ways over a variety of time scales, days, months, years. Yeah, it's a tough question. Yeah, I think the, um, it will be kind of a maybe bidirectional learning in some way. Uh, in the sometimes scales that we will might fix our algorithms and we prefer to have like more stable kind of performance. But of course, if the over time the person in the brain will learn how to use better the BCI, we'll need to update our models. So there will be kind of an interactive uh, kind of uh, uh, relationship in some way. Um, to learn even a, a new tasks, this probably yeah will be something we'll over time we'll need to learn what the person kind of uh, learn how to interact with the computer and then build the appropriate interface, the UX and also the UI and uh, build algorithms that will, uh, will help him to control what we want. Just one thing I'd like to add on to what Nir said. Um, yeah, it actually is an advantage in some ways that the brain is plastic and learns, and that can help us because we actually have to do less work, and the, the human in the loop will actually learn how to use our device better. Um, but one of the advantages of our particular approach in device is that we are trying to do an extremely high channel count device, so we can you know uniformly distribute electrodes over a functional region, and then it doesn't matter so much whether things move or shift over time. We can offload that to software, and so we can build algorithms that change over time as well. Um, and so both those things are actually, I think, advantages to our, our particular approach. We have another question from Twitter. Juan wants to know what career path do you suggest for somebody that is just getting out of high school if they want to work at Neuralink in the future? Well, it's really any of the skills that we described. Uh, so I mean, we're developing uh, <laughs> new chips, uh, new, uh, there's material science, uh, you know, there's uh, software, obviously, uh, animal care. I mean, it's a uh, really all the, all the things that we listed in the in the Neuralink slash careers. That that'd be a good guide. Yeah, I, I'm actually very fond of saying, um, you know, when you flip through any college uh, booklets and look through all the majors. I think you can point to every single one of those majors and there's someone at this company who either is an expert or, you know, have majored in that. So it, it really is um, truly, truly multidisciplinary endeavor. Um, and I think, you know, just focus on whatever you're um, you know, passionate about or whatever you're talented at and then just, you know, pursue that as deeply as you can. And then uh, there's definitely going to be a place for you in uh, your building neural interfaces. 
Hey. Great hey, advice. We got to see the monkeys doing telepathy, but could you say a little bit more about the be uh, animal behavioral training, kind of their lives and day-to-day -day processes? Sure. I'm Autumn. I am head of research services, which includes our animal care program. Um, and as an animal welfare scientist, this is a topic that I'm deeply interested in. So um, our uh, training program is outfitted mostly with behavior analysts who help us think about how to remove any of the uh, potential aversives or frustrations from our training. Um, we think about uh, conditioning uh, as the primary, uh, which includes positive reinforcement as the primary uh, way to train. Um, let's see, what else can I share with you? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that may not be part of uh, the behavioral training itself, but we think of animal welfare assessment in the framework of the three R's, which is refinement, replacement, and reduction. And so when we think about refinement, behavioral training does apply in, in that way and where we want to remove uh, specifically in research uh, restraint is one of the things we make a very top goal to remove. So um, you saw a lot of videos today where animals were walking up to their stations because we worked really hard to remove any requirement to restrain the animal. Um, anything else? Yeah, if I, if I can just, yeah. Well, just on top of the last point you said, um, just a, as an engineer here, one of the things that is really inspiring and really cool about this place is that we do get to work on a lot of technological innovations that directly translate to greater independence for the animals when they're engaging in these tasks. So as you saw, you know, monkeys charge just by voluntarily walking up to a branch. They play games in their home habitat with a laptop computer um, voluntarily. And the fully implantable, fully wireless device, the inductive charger, all these things enable that kind of experience. And so this is one of the very cool parts about working here is we do get to innovate on things like that. Definitely helps to with a rock star. The group of engineers who can like really make cool stuff for, for monkeys to be able to do easier behavioral training. Yeah, so I guess to uh, answer the previous question about what you can study to be part of Neuralink, I guess monkey engineering, you can add to, add to that. <laughs> monkey business. These jokes are Hello. just so no, good. Um, my question is on uh, upgrade, upgradability, which you guys mentioned quite a bit. Um, so in that procedure, I imagine there's some kind of expand procedure, and then you're going to put in a new set of implants. So could you talk about um, the damage possible, if any, uh, tissue damage from the expand procedure? Uh, how long you have to wait? Um, do you implant the same areas and uh, what's your like brain scanning um, for the implant uh, procedure uh, in terms of upgrading it? Um, I don't know how many questions I can ask. Uh, but <laughs> I, well, well, after this. So I can start to speak to some of those. Um, so I, I work a lot on upgradability and those explant processes and uh, designing those to be better. Um, the the, the goal that we're working towards is that, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, it's really just as easy to upgrade an implant as it is to initially install. Um, we didn't we didn't show many of those explant uh, examples today, um, but we've come pretty close to just popping out an implant uh, and reinstalling another one in the exact same location. Definitely, definitely the goal, is, we are installing the implant in primary motor cortex, which is a valuable area for uh, interacting with a device like this. And so we, the goal is to implant in the same location. Maybe if you expand out to other applications, then you'd be interested in moving somewhere else. Um, but we definitely want to be able to insert into the same area. Um, in terms of damage, the, I think the, the damage that we care most about is uh, damage within the brain. And what we've found, and we, we talked about that, that challenge of the tissue layer on top of the brain, and we're, I think we're well on our way towards figuring that out. Um, but because of the thread's small size, the, the sort of scar capsule within the brain is so minimal that they are actually removed quite easily. And so we see 
useful signals even on the second or third time that you've placed an implant. And I think uh, some of our BCI folks can probably speak to that. We, we do have uh, monkey participants uh, working with their second devices and uh, really making use of those. So one, uh, two questions. One was somebody had asked the question about the brain bean plastic. Have you noticed any plasticity from a behavior perspective from any of the monkeys? Or is it too soon to tell or there haven't been any observations? From the monkey behavior, we see that it takes them a while to learn how to, of course, to train on the task, but also when they are reimplanted. Uh, it's relatively quickly for them to ramp up and get to a high performance of brain control. Uh, with Pedro, for example, after a few days, he was able to, like three days already, able to learn very quickly to use the device. He was trained on the task, of course, from this previous implant, but with the new one, he was, after three, four days, uh, he was able to control to a, a close to performance of he, he had with the previous implant. But have you noticed anything on the adverse side which means the brain has outpaced the neural network that you're running. It's hard to say. Um, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> so I have a, another question, uh, which is more about the electrical side. So you talked about 1,024 uh, channels being recording. Are you transmitting the raw signal, or was it only the three spike events that you were talking about, the low, mid, and the high, or is it the raw entire raw form, waveform that you transmit. Yeah, hi, I'm Julian. I can speak a bit about this and maybe Avanash wants to contribute, but um, our chips see the raw signals, but then when we transmit out, uh, typically spikes, and we detect those spikes in real time on the chip. This massively compresses the data. Um, I guess, yeah, we're making improvements to that, but we can request, we can request raw samples. Sometimes we also process uh, particular statistics or other data directly on the chip and then send out the, the calculated values. Um, so there are many ways to sort of play with the data. Yeah, so at least with the current N1 system that we have, which relies on uh, BLE radio, uh, there is a bandwidth limitation, so you can't actually stream raw data from all 1,024 channels. Uh, but just kind of to give you a little bit of a history of how our compression algorithm, the spike detection algorithm was developed, we did have sort of a wire system. I, there was a paper that we published with the USB-C uh, connector that you know, streams all those signals um, through a uh, high, high bandwidth uh, wire connection. So we did have kind of those development platform to be able to see the raw signals and know which set of information that we want to extract that are you know, going to fit within the bandwidth of the uh, radio as well as is useful for PCI control. And you know, also just sending data wirelessly does cost a lot of energy. Um, so there's any opportunities we have to reduce that uh, burden. Uh, you know, we try to do basically have all that compression closer to where the electrodes are as possible. Uh, and what, <clears throat> maybe one thing that isn't obvious is that the the actual uh, bit rate that you need to control a phone or a uh, computer is actually very very low. So I, I think we might have the record for bit rate. Is that? Correct. We think we do. Uh, maybe so on the order of ten bits per second. So that's super slow. Um, but if you think like if, when you're inputting data into a phone, like how fast are your thumbs moving, how many thumb, what's your thumb taps per second? Pretty pretty low. And um, I mean, we're like basically our thumbs are like two slow moving meat sticks that we, you know do this and it's like this is really low it's like a low bar is what I'm saying um, so for at least for output it's it's a you, know, you get 10 bits per second you're you're holding ass uh, so and that's you don't need blue, you have Bluetooth anything for you so you could practically send it out with beeps and bops you know uh, so it's not it's, if you go if you're going like a high bandwidth visual now you're you know maybe going to megabit plus but it's it's still it's really well within Bluetooth, uh, or but anyway, it's just, we're, we're, that is what I'm saying is that's not, that's not a constraint that the, the data rate. Um, 
one of the sort of like maybe notable item which we talked about in the presentation, but uh, we we think we can probably solve for doing the implant without cutting the the dura. We can just do basically a bunch of holes through the dura, which is like the dura is like the big thick orange rindy thing that uh, contains the that's up, up against the skull. If, if you don't pierce the dura. You know, if you, don't, if you don't cut the door away, and instead you have a bunch of tiny holes and insert the electrodes through the tiny holes uh, into the brain, um, and then the recovery time is ridiculously fast. Um, you know, you're, you're not really losing much in the way of cerebrospinal fluid. It's, it's, you could in theory, we, I mean, this could be like a, the whole thing could be a 10 minute operation, like LASIK. Like it's fast. It's not like a big laborious thing. It's super fast. Crazy. Uh, just going back to the long-term use, I'm wondering if you have any pathology looking at scar tissue um, from many animals that have had long-term implants. Um, and along that line, it seems like there might be a little bit of a gap between use um, in medical conditions and healthy individuals from a safety perspective. I didn't quite catch, catch the last question, but um, I'll hear the first one. I'll ask you to repeat the uh, the second one. So the first one is, do we have pathology from, from long-term use animals? We absolutely do. Um, we don't have any pathology from our monkeys, which we upgrade and you know are, are still going. We have uh, other studies that are Triple primarily one. to determine safety. And so we do have histopathologic endpoints that we, we determine. The scar tissue formation around the threads themselves in the brain is typically negligible, like it barely reacts to the threads at all. Um, so that, that's very promising. In terms of the scar tissue formation over the, uh, the cortex, so this neomembrane growth that fills in the areas that uh, Elon and Alex were mentioning that we remove with our current operation, um, those, uh, we, we do you know, evaluate that scar tissue, but it, isn't, uh, it doesn't pose a problem in any way. Um, it's not a continuous reaction to a foreign body. It's just filling in tissue that was removed. Um, and if you could repeat the uh, the second question, I didn't hear that. Yeah, the second question really following up on that, seems like there might be a little bit of a gap in use uh, in healthy individuals uh, from a safety perspective. Um, you know, I think people mentioned that they might be interested in trying prototypes, but um, just wondering what your perspective is on trying to lower the, the safety risks. Yeah, it, it's it's a great question. So. In terms of really, it's about the long-term use of the device. So, you know, we have devices that have been implanted, like I said, in monkeys, where you know, for many years, where we see no behavioral deficit at all. So, then this first is a question of how you evaluate safety. So, you have histopathologic endpoints you can evaluate, but we're also looking for cognitive deficits or behavioral deficits as well. And we don't see any of those in our animals, um, which is you know, an important point. Um, in terms of the histopathologic endpoints, they look really, really great. The challenge is one of explanting the device, which is why we're putting so much effort into the reversibility uh, efforts and our through dura insertions. Um, so when removing the device, that's when you potentially could cause damage. And so we are doing, we have a lot of ongoing studies right now to really minimize the risk of that. But we don't think it's a, a substantial risk um, with our current approach. And like I said, Pager was upgraded with the previous surgical approach and is doing great. So clearly it is, you know, can be perfectly safe, but proving that beyond a shadow of a doubt for humans is something that we're still working to do rigorously. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you for a very deep dive on many of the different aspects of the device and the system. It's very impressive to see uh, all the engineering work that's gone into it. Um, you just mentioned about bitrate. Uh, as the prior bitrate holder, um, I can confirm you have indeed shattered my record. So congratulations on, I think I saw a peak of 7.4 bits per second. Well done. Um, my question is actually around uh, clinical trials and the FDA. To the extent that you can share, uh, I gather that, that device removal uh, or maybe electrode removal is one of the concerns that the FDA highlighted. Is there anything else you can tell us about what the FDA um, was concerned about or had questions about with respect to their ID submission? Yeah, I mean, we can probably talk a little bit. I mean, it's, it's these are really challenges you know, that we have broadly. So uh, explantation safety, proving that right rigorously for humans uh, is something that we definitely is one challenge and was something that, that the FDA commented on. Um, other things that they do ask some really great questions. So other things involve, uh, you know, things like the thermal bench shop testing of our implants. So obviously it's important that our implant doesn't damage the tissue by overheating. 
So having really rigorous and valid bench shop testing for that is very important. It's actually something that we're redesigned to be even more uh, accurate now. Um, it's also the case that you know they, they ask a lot of very hard questions on biocompatibility, chemical characterization. So we've done very rigorous testing for that, but you know they they do ask a lot of questions about getting into the weeds of the data and making sure that there really is, is no chance for any toxic chemicals um, or, or bioincompatible materials to be in the brain. So these are all things we're working with, you know, to uh, to just prove again above and beyond uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt. One thing that's maybe worth mentioning here is that it can be difficult to appreciate the novelty of our product. Um, so the surgical robot and the thin film array in particular are, are quite new and unlike existing devices. And this means that we can't rely heavily on literature to support the safety um, and efficacy of the device. So we do spend a ton of effort in designing and performing testing on our devices um, so that we can rigorously prove the safety of them. And, and we can't rely just on another product or on some paper. Um, and that's something that we're not willing to compromise for our first team participant and working very hard to do. I think if you, if you ask a question like, um, like, in my opinion, like, would, would I be comfortable implanting this in someone, you know, one of my kids or something like that? If uh, at, at this point, like if, if they were in a serious, like, let's say they, um, if they broke their neck, would I feel comfortable right now doing it? I would, I, I would say we're, we're, we're at the point where I, at least uh, in my opinion, it, it would not be dangerous. It's a good sign. Um, hi, thank you for the presentation. Risky. Uh, so I have a non-technical question. Um, are you collaborating with uh, people with uh, motor disabilities? And if so, have they shared any um, ideas of applications that they would be excited about? I can take the first part of this. I'm not the best person to speak to this, uh, to be honest, but there is a consumer advisory board we have made up of a number of people that have uh, various conditions, including tetraplegia, and they give advice to us on a number of topics. <laughs> There's, uh, just as an anecdote, someone came to the office uh, maybe six months ago, and they were telling me what they most wanted to do with their Neuralink device, and there were two things that they said. One was they wanted to be able to trade stocks day to day <laughs> to be able to beat their brother. <laughs> And the second one was they wanted to be able to play shooter games. <laughs> so I think what was most shocking to me about that encounter was the normalcy of that. And I found that conversation truly inspiring. So you know who you are, the person who came and talked with me. Um, have a good day. It was day. me. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, what, something that's uh, we've talked about, but it's maybe uh, it should be reemphasized. Uh, we are doing a, we're, we're building up a production system for the devices. So we're, we're building up, bringing out the production line, making large numbers of devices. We want to make thousands, ultimately tens of thousands and millions of devices. So the, the progress at first, particularly as it applies to humans will seem perhaps agonizingly slow, but we're, we're doing all of the things necessary to bring it to scale in parallel. So in theory, it should, uh, Progress should be exponential. Okay, so thank you. That was a very cool presentation. Um, so one of the stated goals was recording from everywhere in the brain, being able to record from and perturb any uh, location. So it seems like currently it's all cortical. Um, and I'm curious, with the current device, is, it, is there any sort of long-term goal or idea as to extending it into going deeper in the brain? I mean. For neuropsychiatric disorders, for memory, all of these things are much deeper, several centimeters. Great so I'm question. wondering, what's the time scale, if you were to give a very rough estimate, of when I can expect to see a Neuralink product that goes that deep? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the fundamentals of the device um, in the skull will stay essentially the same because, the, as I said earlier, the the device in the skull is very much like a, like a smartwatch. Essentially, it's got it's a battery, radio, inductive charger, uh, computer, and um, and then you've got the, the the little wires. And so you need to make the wires longer, and you'd have to have a, a deeper insertion uh, needle for the robot. But it, this really is intended to be a generalized I/O device. So apart from the tiny wires being longer. Um, and the surgical robot needing a longer needle, in theory, you should be able to go anywhere. Because uh, it seems to me that part of the robot is trying to detect where the blood vessels are and then avoid them, correct? Would that be possible 
at that scale? I mean, certainly not just visually, but maybe there's some other way of detecting it. Uh, is that is that like is that a current goal? And do you expect that within, I suppose, the next decade? Uh, definitely, yes. I'm, I'm Ian. I run the robotics and surgery engineering team here. Um, like, of the three axes that DJ mentioned, one of them is you know access to more areas of the brain. So the robot team thinks about this a ton in terms of uh, what sensors do you need to essentially go past the surface. Um, and so in this case, you're right that right now we can really only see down uh, the maximum about a millimeter. Um, I think within the team, there's uh, questions of what's best to use next, uh, but like ultrasound and photoacoustic tomography are two that come to mind as things that can get centimeters deep essentially. Um, but it's a super interesting problem. You sort of need deep imaging uh, and some ability to steer to at least uh, avoid large vasculature uh, deep down. Um, yeah. Or if, our, if we can make our needles and threads small enough in a way that we can still be uh, precise and accurate at a deep depth, then maybe you don't cause a bleed if you hit a vessel. Yeah, I think that's, that's really the ideal situation. If the, the threads are really tiny, they can actually go th through a blood vessel um, and, it's, and it's okay if, in the, you know, if they're tiny enough. So, so we, wouldn't, we wouldn't need the blood vessel imaging in that case. I, I'm, I, I actually am slightly optimistic that, that that is achievable. Matt, you could probably speak more into this, but with DBS currently, it's kind of just like send it. <laughs> yeah, the, the current approach involves a, a wire that you blindly pass in that's massive compared to our threads, orders of magnitude bigger. Um, and so that's a low bar for us to clear as well. I guess people don't realize, like, before the deep brain simulation, just how big the hole is. <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's, what is it, like... I mean, how, how, how basically, it, in current deep brain simulation, how much of a borehole is dr drilled in the brain? Yeah, you're, you're drilling um, a 14 millimeter burr hole and then passing a two millimeter wire, um, you know, six centimeters, eight centimeters deep into the brain. So all blindly hoping that you don't hit a blood vessel, telling the patient up front, this might be good for you. And there's a 1% chance you're gonna, your brain is going to bleed in a way we can't control. So that is current technology that is happening right now. So doing better than that is we can Big definitely do way better than that. No problem. Our needle is 40 microns. Right. <laughs> yeah. um. Thanks again for the phenomenal presentation. Uh, I thought it was fascinating how rapidly you could test all of these electrodes, but it begs the question about like what your fault tolerance is. If you run these diagnostics and it comes back that you have something that's either shorted or high Z, how many of those before you get degraded performance? And the second question is uh, when you're actually uh, inserting this device, we saw examples of the electrode going in and then like looping back on itself, but it looked like that was something that was assessed basically by slicing the synthetic material. I'm curious what you're doing to validate um, the insertion of all these electrodes sort of in vivo. How do we know that that's not happening on uh, an actual patient? Yeah, uh, I can answer that sec the second one. Um, so like I mentioned, we can, um, so we weren't actually sectioning in that case. We have a really cool micro CT. Um, so it, I mean, it's essentially like a CT scanner. So that's just an intact proxy that we put in this machine and, and it, we can you know, take a picture all the way through it. Um, and like I mentioned before, like we can make a proxy where it happens, you know, that, that looping back happens every single time. And then we can make one where it never happens. Um, and we've pinpointed roughly now where actual tissue falls in there. And so our, our current plan for you know, validating and confirming that is making proxies where it you know, happens really easily, much worse case than any, you know, any tissue could possibly be, um, and then designing it such that it never happens in that scenario. And that'll give us the doing that enough times and with a weak enough proxy, um, that'll give us the confidence that this isn't actually happening. Um, Yeah, and yeah, and this is the next gen needle. Uh, we don't see this problem at all with the, the current generation. And I'll take a stab at your first question. So to clarify, you're asking what happens if there's a fault on a particular channel or something? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so um, the nominal scenario is that basically the impedance will stabilize pretty quickly within the brain. And even at that level, we can record great signals. We see lots of spikes and we can use that for BCI. Um, because we have so many channels, like 1,000 now, 16,000 later, uh, we can 
actually run our models with far less channels than we actually have. So it doesn't matter if like one channel dies here or there, like we can still do really good decode. I'm not sure if we have official numbers on how many channels we need, but it, it's like we have an order of magnitude more and the more we have the better, but we can already do a lot with what we have. Like maybe just a, one, one or two more questions. Yeah, I have a question about your um, very, very long-term uh, inspiration to have this high bandwidth communication with advanced AIs. So it seems like you know the advanced AI would need to understand the human's most complex thoughts and emotions, and that's what neuroscientists are trying to do. So do you have any ambitions to tackle neuroscience beyond neuroengineering? Well, I mean, I think we're, you know, we're going to make the input output device and the software interface with it. And I think probably, um, you know, for the suggestion earlier, we'll, we'll try to open source as much as possible so people can take a look at it. And I think uh, there will be a lot of others that, that build upon the work that we're doing. Um, you know, the same way that uh, if you make a, if you make a microprocessor or, or CPU or computer, uh, that people will write uh, lots of software that runs on that computer. Um, so. But if, if you don't have the computer, it's, it's, the software is moot. So we're, we're making the input output device with the computer. And, um, and then I think probably there, there, there'll probably be a lot of other organizations, companies that, that built, um, that build upon that foundation. So yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that's, uh, I would sometimes wonder is that if, if you do have a whole brain interface, and you can record memories. Um, you're really getting into Black Mirror stuff here. Uh, but um, this could be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also think it's worth uh, mentioning an important point, which is that Neuralink didn't come out of nothing. Uh, there's decades and decades of uh, research in the medical academic field that has really set the foundation for what is possible uh, by putting these electrodes in parts of the brain and being able to read those signals, decode it for mapping it to some application. And um, you know, being being in academia before before coming to Neuralink, um, you know, the, I, I do think that there is a lot of opportunities for kind of the field to advance at a much rapid rate by having just better tools for observing the dynamics that are happening and then engaging with it in a seamless way. And I think it was uh, Ian who sort of mentioned that, you know, it's almost as if like we're kind of building an oscilloscope for the brain, which I think is like kind of a beautiful analogy of just giving us a, a bit more abilities into peering into the dynamics uh, and using those information, learn that to, I don't know, hopefully understand like what makes us and how the brain works and, you know, the whole shebang. Hello. The presentation covered keyboard and handwriting based input methods. How do you plan to develop an input model that will achieve much higher bandwidths for complex tasks in humans? Yeah, this is a, a tough question, and it's, we start exploring this with monkeys. As you saw, we have like a multiple. We train many monkeys on very different tasks. It's still an open question that we're after. I think hopefully once we get to our first participant, it will be easier to investigate. One of the options we are exploring, as we showed, is uh, to decode handwriting directly. Uh, this is a, one, uh, a work that started at Stanford, and we are exploring here and trying to expand. There's also a different, uh, in addition to just decoding different things from the brain, we also try to uh, provide the user different, uh, maybe user like interfaces. For example, we show different type of keyboards, maybe also swipe and other things that can help uh, increase the communication rate. So we are kind of tackling those in two dimensions. Yeah, just one other thing to add in that direction. Uh, as pointed out by many people here so far, this is a general IO system that you can sort of plug and play in different places of the brain. There's other areas of the brain that can help increase bandwidth, for example, language or speech centers that can help you uh, much more seamlessly communicate, for example, text, if that's your main thing that you're trying to do. Yeah, just ha I think just having this general input output device will just so gigantically improve our understanding of the brain. It's, it's, it's hard to, it, the words can barely express. Like, you know, uh, right, right now we're just guessing a, a lot of what's going on in the brain. But if you have 
direct uh, IO. It's not no more guessing what we would learn about the what we will learn about the rain with such a device in in wide use uh, is absolutely or many orders of magnitude more than we currently understand. So um, I guess on that on that note, uh, uh, thank you for coming and thank you for watching online. And, uh, You're welcome, Elon. Thank you. Eight to black. Wow. Wow. Is producer wife still awake? Let's see. Producer wife, take us to the irregular view. I'm going to give her 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. I think we lost producer wife. 4. Yeah, she's gone. <laughs> All right. Producer wife has fallen asleep at her desk more, more than likely. Okay. Wow. That was a lot longer than I expected. But great. So good that we got some uh, great information. Thank you very much for sticking with me and the stream. We started three hours and 40 minutes ago, and we're still going, and my lower back is killing me. But that's okay. I'll stretch before I go to bed. <sighs> How you feel it? <laughs> okay. Let's pull it together. We can do this. Producer wife has passed out. I'm on my own right now, but that's okay. That's how we got started. Here are my notes. And I, as I go through my notes, um, please drop your thoughts on the comment section below or next to you or whatever. I'll highlight some of the commentary and then I'll let you go to bed because I'm sure a lot of us are uh, uh, excited to go to bed here. We have stuff to do tomorrow, but that's okay too. All right. So, and I have four sort of pages of hand scribble. The biggest thing right now that I took away is that they're massively focusing on production, right? So they they're moving out out of the prototyping phase and more into the production phase. In about six months, they're expecting to do the first human trials. That's when they think the FDA is going to give them approval. Super focused on safe on safety, uh, and they've uh, tested I think six different monkeys is what I gathered, and they've been upgrading the monkeys. So they've been taking out the old neural link and putting the new one in. They have upgradable monkeys, literally upgradable monkeys Neuralink. you should put, make that into a t-shirt um they've been able to do a bunch of confirmation with pointer movement with the brain which is really cool it's upgradable like i said so if you, you know you don't you're not stuck with the old Neuralink, you can get a new one crazy uh they've had one monkey named pager with uh one and a half years with a Neuralink in its device and it's been upgraded once so that's pretty freaking wild um they always make sure the animals are happy. So for those that are worried about that, I'm sure you're, you're happy to hear that. They are looking to restore vision, even for people that have never seen before, which is completely wild. They went through a whole presentation on how to do that. And uh, they're also looking to restore muscle and limb movement, right? So if you have a severed spine or you're, or you're a quadriplegic or some sort of para, uh, paraplegic where you can't move your sort of limbs, then they're looking to solve that, which is it's not a, it's not news for those that have been following the Neuralink story, but that it's just worth repeating just how insanely crazy that is, right? Um, so even if your spinal cord is severed, you can regain um, movement. And they're hiring like crazy. So this presentation was obviously super technical heavy. You could tell everybody in the crowd was very technically savvy. I have some comments about that towards the end here. Um, yeah, and they're looking for people that would have expertise that's similar to somebody who would be working on a, on a watch or a phone. So if you're interested, go to their website, Neuralink.com slash careers, I'm sure. Um, they have an implant right now with the Neuralink chip. It's called the N1, about 1,024 channels, not about exactly 1,024 channels. Their next generation looking to get it to 16,000 channels. So that's a 16X times capability, one would think. And they have a ro surgical robot called R1, uh, which is a... Um, robot that automatically avoids blood vessels. So when the robot's going into your brain, it knows how to skip your blood vessels, which is kind of wild. Towards the end of the presentation, they said they ideally they would need a needle. They would want a needle that's so small that it doesn't break your blood vessel and just goes right through it. And you don't even have to worry about where the needle goes, which is completely nuts. The production's here in Austin, Texas. I'm local to Austin. Maybe I'll go work for them one day. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, I like this though. <laughs> Um, and they they want to start their own clinic as well. So they want to have like a Neuralink clinic where you, you go, like you go get LASIK, you go get Neuralink. Pretty freaking crazy. Uh, and, they, and they've been able to uh, make the processing speed twice as fast as the first generation 
uh, Neuralink. So that the way the pointer moved was able to move essentially twice as fast. And they've minimized lag, which helps with feedback, right? Because I don't know if you've ever played games before, like shooters, when you're pointing your mouse and stuff, like lag's the worst. They're hugely focused on recruiting, which I mentioned. <clears throat> Neuralink can do about uh, 20 million calculations per second. I don't know if that's the chip itself or not. I have that written down. I might be wrong. Please uh, ignore that. It's obvious that they have a team for everything. So that's one thing that really stood out to me, that people on stage are all freaking brilliant. And every single subset of the process that you would ever think of for this thing has a person and a team attached to it. And that person that that speaks is brilliant. <laughs> so it's a reinforcement at how good Elon is at being that magnet for talent. So that's con continuously becomes a theme with Elon and his companies. doesn't matter what the hell he's working on. And it's obvious, too, that the dude doesn't have time for, for Neuralink right now. It's very obvious. I mean, he gave the presentation, like, all right, somebody else take it. And it was very similar to the AI Day presentation. It's becoming a new theme for Elon, it seems like. It's like, just delegate, 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 delegate. And I love to see that. One, for him, so he doesn't freaking collapse from being overworked. And two, allows uh, other folks to rise up and really achieve their, their true talent and their true sort of capacity right so i love that trend that's starting to happen with elon it's i could not be happier and he should lean even harder into it with as much as with as many things as humanly possible love to see it and you can obviously tell that that group of people are super super talented and they look like they have a lot of fun together as well that's another thing i got from their body language very good to see um they have wireless charging for the chip so literally they had a monkey just hanging under a a, a like a, what was a tree branch that had the charger in there and it can charge wirelessly, which is like wild. It's like a watch charger on your head. <laughs> they have custom built chips, very similar to how Tesla does it for all their applications, which is really, really cool. And um, <laughs> look, ma, no wires. I wrote that down because there was uh, Christine was her name, I think. She just had jokes for days. Some of them were good. And the uh, goal is to get to the point that it's like LASIK. So I kind of mentioned that before, right? So it's, um, <laughs> that's, I just ripped into Christine. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> it, she's funny. She's good. But anyway, um, goal is to get to the point where it's like LASIK. So you think about LASIK and how quick it is to go in there and just kind of get your eye surgery done. Again, the idea for Neuralink long term is to be able to do that. Uh, then they want to know they've been doing by this point a very technical presentation which literally a hundred percent of it went over my head so if you came here for technical knowledge i'm really sorry i don't have it but it was obvious that the team knew what they were talking about especially during the q a section uh, which i'll talk about briefly here and um let's see what else do i have on here that yeah, Elon, Elon was very off, sort of, they let these guys run. I'm sure he was not involved at all in the last few weeks, at least, with Twitter going crazy. Pretty sure these folks were just on their own doing the thing. Uh, they want to get to the point where you'll be able to install this thing in your head in 10 minutes, which would be insane. And then we're kind of walking through this process where, I guess, the Dura is the protective layer between, like, the bone and the brain itself and the fluid. And if you break the dura apart, the healing process takes a lot longer. But if you're able to pierce through the dura, which is that protective layer of the brain and the fluid, you pierce through it instead of opening it up, then theoretically, the healing time for that becomes basically almost nothing, which is ideal, right? You want to make this as easy as humanly possible. And... Um, they're they're considering open sourcing their data as well one of the questions during the q a thing came up is like hey would you be willing to open source your stuff and elon's like yeah sure why not very elon answer and um let's see one of the uh, potential things that Neuralink could be used for that's not used for right now obviously but could be long term it's just general health monitoring i guess there's a lot of different signals your brain can sort of push that makes you aware of like you know fevers i think was one of the examples that elon threw out there so there's a lot of use cases for Neuralink. it's not just specific to like vision and you know say uh, paraplegics you can use it for a lot of things which is really really cool um 
Apparently the brain moves a lot, which was a new thing for me. And I, I didn't know. I thought the brain was very stationary, but apparently it moves quite a bit. I mean, if I'm moving my head right now, I, I guess, I guess it's moving. <laughs> it's late, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> And then they want to get the neural net to run. They want to get a neural net to run on the chip, it sounds like, as well. So, like, think about the implications of that. Getting a super complex piece of code to just run on a little chip, which is freaking nuts. Anyway, those were my high-level takeaways from the presentation. I think, overall, my biggest takeaway from, a, from my perspective, which is a non-technical person, is that Elon continues to be this person that is able to just... just attract so much freaking talent and we're seeing a lot of that talent lately and it's awesome because these are just hardcore engineers they as regular as they can be super clunky around the mic on a stage so it's super endearing and it warms my heart to see them struggle up there <laughs> but it, but it's it's one dimension right it's like that's just a speaking dimension you can obviously tell that they're super technically savvy super brilliant people and it seems like they really like each other because i just just the way they interacted with each other was really it was cute you know they would laugh at each other's jokes and shit. if you had a team that didn't like each other that wouldn't happen so that was really cool to see yeah so what were your takeaways drop them in the comment section below let's go through a few of them and then i'll let you go because we're almost four hours in my god i am tired <laughs> But I, I'm so thankful you stuck around with me. Seriously. Thank you all so much for sticking around with me. Let's read just read a few comments here. Uh, Twitter on Starlink. Yet another project for Mars Major needed for communications. Yes. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of YouTubers who will make detailed breakdowns on the presentation. I'm sure there will. And I'm very much looking forward to those that are a little bit more digestible. Um, at least for me, because that was super technical for a lot of it. Seems exclusively analog muscle vision related versus thought uh, example, language processing solutions. So very achievable. Yeah, for sure. I think that that's a great takeaway. Um, however, if the brain, you know, one of the comments was, well, the brain does everything. So theoretically, we can get there. So right now, they're very much focused on the things that are low hanging fruit, probably from like a quality of, of life improvement. And then over time, I'm sure they'll get hardcore into... Um, yeah, hardcore into that stuff. Farza taking them analog notes and everybody's saying he was falling asleep, about to fall asleep. <laughs> Both can exist in the same realm. I was not falling asleep. I was honestly like, it was just so technical. And it's, I was trying my hardest to like figure out what they were saying. And some, just, a lot of times I couldn't. And that's okay. That's just not my area of expertise, you know? It is what it is. Uh, my, my takeaway is that the first product is probably months away, not years. Yeah, I mean, if the FDA gives them approval in six months, like they think they, they could get it, um, we just got a freaking pop up for ad block, which is literally the opposite of what I got it for. My takeaway is that the first product is probably a month away, not years. Uh, yeah, I agree. If they can get that FDA approval, they'll be able to get there very, very quickly. Thank you, Farzad. See you tomorrow for the semi stream. Go to bed. Thank you. Thank you very much for sticking around. Tomorrow, semi, I'll be on again. Who knows? It might be another four-hour stream. It's my life now. <laughs> a thousand likes achieved. Seems like a, a free farts, a t-shirt giveaway opportunity. Not to me, someone else's. I've got a few. We should do one. I'll figure something out for tomorrow. Um, yeah, I'll figure something out for tomorrow. I'm like completely shot in the head. I want to make sure I do this right. But we'll do a t-shirt gi giveaway. I'll, I'll have more... Um, data on that or data i have more information on that if i'll probably do it on twitter if you want to be part of it add farziness go follow me on there we'll make sure we make it happen all right let's take a couple more and we'll call, we'll call this a day uh thank you so much farzad you made it much more enjoyable and uh ingestible thank you i hope that's i hope that's the case uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much value i added here but uh i hope it was a cool place for all of us to hang out in right that's really the intention behind these things and uh Let's do a couple more. It's crazy how they're not even challenged by the Neuralink itself, but really the scale of producing this. At, and it means they're that close to need to produce a lot. Yeah, that's a great point, right? It goes back to it's not about production. It's a, it's not about prototyping. It's about um, production. That's really what it comes down to, which is the craziest part of it. So get just scaling it up to where it needs to be. 
All right. Um, let's just end it with this. Good night, y'all. This was awesome. Awesome. I agree. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hit the like. Hit the subscribe. If you want some of this merch, description below. Thank you for everybody who uh, gave super chats, super thanks. Thanks to everybody who was part of the comment section. Four hour long stream. We don't mess around here, y'all. We, we're going to watch things that go over our heads and we're going to try our absolute best to digest it and give you the information. Hopefully it was valuable, but in the end, I hope it was fun and entertaining. Uh, th this is really one of the, for these live streams, for these events, my goal is to just give you a place where we can all hang out together, one big family and just, just kind of be like, holy shit, this technology is insane. Let's nerd out together. So with that, I'll let you go. Have a good night's sleep for those that are in the time zone where you go to sleep now. For those that are just waking up, good morning. I hope your coffee tasted great this morning. Thank you all, everybody. Tomorrow, semi, Tesla semi delivery event. I'll probably start live streaming around 4 o'clock central, 4 p.m. central, and maybe 4.30. But there'll be a link for that on YouTube. So just, you know, look me up, subscribe to the channel so you can be see it or be notified. You know, click the bell and then you'll be notified once the stream goes live. So thank you all very much. Mwah. Take it easy, everybody. Have a great night. Have a great day, depending on what time zone you're on, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.